morning, everyone. Thank you for attending the Plain Spotted Skunk webinar. We're going to begin. Before we begin, there are a couple things that I would like you guys to know. Uh, we will be recording the presentation itself, so please keep that in mind. And all questions will be asked after the, um, the webinar. So what we're going to do is we're going to hold all questions to the end. And if you see that email at the bottom of the um, screen right now, the egesm webinar at cpa.texas.gov, please send all of your questions to that site. What we're going to do is each presenter is going to present, and then at the end when we have the roundtable discussion, we'll open up for questions at that point. Also, some of the presenters cannot stay the entire time, so I'm going to email those specific questions that you have for the presenters to them directly, and they should be able to respond to you um, as soon as they get a chance to do so. So first and foremost, I'm going to open up and sort of tell you what we do here at the Comptroller's Office. It's usually a very big question that everyone asks. Um, why is the Comptroller's Office doing anything with um, endangered species? So the first thing that I want to do is sort of tell you what we do, why we do it, and kind of uh, the purpose of this webinar and where we're trying to go with it. So the Comptroller's Office, we have a really unique Comptroller, um, Glenn Hager, and he thinks that um, there are a lot of natural resources in this state. So we have a lot of different animals and plants and all of those things in the natural state are what make our state so great. And we want to make sure that those natural resources can survive and thrive into the future. But at the same time, we do have an economy and we do want to promote that economy at the same time. But what's unique about this control is he doesn't think that these two items have to be on opposite ends of the scale. We sort of try to merge those two worlds together. And that's our ultimate goal at the Comptroller's Office for the Economic Growth and Endangered Species Management Division. But how do we do that? When you look at economy and conservation, you have many different stakeholders that are involved. And you have to understand each of them because you're not going to get rid of any of them. So, for example, you have the researchers, and those are the strongest representative of the species itself. They know what's going on with the species where it is, what it is, the ecology, the biology, all of that fun stuff. Then you have the landowners, and those are the people who use the land where most species will reside. And you have the general public. You have the municipalities, which are just those big cities that house lots of people, which are not going anywhere anytime soon. And you have organizations, and those can be conservation organizations, those could be nonprofit organizations, those could be organizations that assist stakeholders like NRCS. And then you have industry or business. And like I mentioned, all of these have different goals that they want to achieve and different motives. So when we talk about balancing those two separate worlds, how do you do it? That's the big question, right? In our division, it's divided into two components. We have a research program, and then we have a stakeholder engagement program. And that research program, what we do is we fund research studies to Texas um, state public universities that are eligible. And we can either do it through RFPs or interagency contracts. And when we fund research on potentially listed, threatened or endangered species or already listed species, we focus on three primary factors. The first factor is when is that listing determination? Is it going to be this year or is it going to be 10 years down the line? The sooner that listing decision is, the higher ranking we, we see that. And the next thing that we look at are, what are the existing data gaps? What is known about the species? What's known about the population or the range? What's known about the habitats and needs of the species itself? Um, for example, with freshwater mussels, a lot isn't known. There are a lot of gaps. We don't even know what the host fish is, so the reproductive cycle is almost a mystery to us. And then what are those potential impacts of a listing decision? So is it a small section or area, or is it a huge span? So if it's a larger area, it will affect more people, and it's of, of higher concern. And that's how the stakeholder engagement component comes in. And so when you look at um, how we divide things out into the research and the stakeholders, often, like I mentioned previously, relatively little is known about these species um, that could potentially be listed. Very little is known about the population, the range, the habitat, um, all those fun things. Sometimes you can't even find the species when you go out to survey, which I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with. 
And because so little is known about the species, it can provide a poor basis for decisions that can have huge, huge effects. So if we go back to freshwater mussels because that's, that's one of my main focuses. If you think about it, um, what we're trying to do, the whole goal is sort of to balance the conservation actions and the species needs. So if we take, for instance, this is gonna be a complete hypothetical situation. If we think about thermal tolerances for aquatic species, if little is known about the species, so there's a lot of data gaps, and there's an assumed range of thermal tolerance between 10 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's what's considered tolerable based off of um, surrogate information or, or whatnot, or anecdotal information, that's what it's thought to be. But the typical output for an industry is 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The industry is gonna have to reduce that, that temperature so it's within that range for the species, but if through additional research, we find out the tolerance um, for the species is actually 20 to 30 degrees, that conservation action doesn't match um, the species needs or the industry's needs. So our ultimate goal is to find that balance between the needs of the species and the stakeholders and sort of cater research so that we can understand exactly what those needs are for the species so we can have the best fit and best match for conservation. So when you balance the needs of these two, you can learn more about the species and you can cater those conservation needs to the species. So I'm going to take you through two examples so you can sort of see what we do and how we do, because I just sort of mentioned things in big theory. It's often nice to put a hardcore example to them. The first one that I'm going to talk to you about is the black rail. And if you go to those three priorities in the research, um, the timeline, data gaps, and the, the area, and when you're looking at the black rail, you see the timeline is September 2018, which is fairly coming up pretty quickly. And then there are a lot of data gaps. And a lot of these data gaps actually relate to each other. So, for example, the coastal development, as, as people um, infringe a little bit more on the habitat, as, as they get closer and closer to that habitat, certain things like nest predation can increase with the additional exposure of domestic dogs and cats to the area. And then you have management conflicts, and it's not just um, something like prescribed burning, but it's more, when you look at it, it's more of time and duration of those, those actions, so those management conflicts. So if you do a prescribed burn during um, breeding season, if the species is able to leave or not, if they're hindered by that, so timing and duration matters. Chemical contaminants, and that's just anything from an oil spill to um, accumulation in sediments, and of course, invasive species. And if you look at that huge area, I mean, the species covers a significant portion of Texas as well as throughout the state, so we are interested in that species. So the first thing that we did, we, we funded a research project with Texas State, and this is one of our researchers, the lead on it, for, uh, Amanda Moore. And she's doing, um, she's doing population estimations and surveys. Um, she's trying to see the nest and fledging success over time. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because I'm not the researcher. She has a much, much more detailed presentation on this if you're interested on a website. But we did fund the research project. And then from that, we also had a work group. Um, we did our first work group meeting, and that was in January. And it started out as the Texas Black Rail Working Group. We had um, 15 attendees and eight presenters. And through our collaborative efforts through multiple states um, with multiple agencies, um, our goal was to unite and shed more light on the species. So we were really trying to get um, a community of researchers together to get more information about the species. And we addressed things like what those research needs were. For example, using eBird or um, if stable isotope analysis was necessary. And we wanted to expand that out. So we wanted to focus in on the research at first and then expand it out to stakeholders. And so from that, we had on October 13th, we had our, our second um, working group meeting. And we did a webinar for that. It was coordinated with Texas Parks and Wildlife Lawn Game Ornithologist Cliff Shackleford. And if you have not worked with them, I highly recommend doing so. There were a total of 10 presentations with presenters from seven states. And the presentations included updates on the East Coast, Gulf Coast, and Midwest portion of the range. We had the lead for the Fish and Wildlife Service SSA process, 
um, provide a detailed summary of where she was at and the information she had and where they were going. And then we had a total of 78 participants that attended. And those participants ranged from everything from industry to state agencies, so parks and wildlife, um, multiple states, um, transportation agencies in the agricultural industry. So we had a lot of people present. So we just went from 15 attendees to 78. So it was a year of pretty much reaching out to everyone and seeing who we could pull to the table and who needed additional information. So that's our, from that, um, we also came up with goals and things that we wanted. So every year in January, I, I make an annual newsletter just for upcoming information, covers the research, all that fun stuff, so that people have access to the information overall. We would started to consolidate our contact lists. So instead of one person sending something out and then um, another person sending it out so people get bombarded with three or four of the exact same email, we started consolidating our lists. And of course, um, we will have another webinar um, once the SSA is established by Fish and Wildlife Service. We also have a website, or I'm developing this as of currently. I would like to share the link with you, but I haven't even done that with the working group yet, so it's kind of on hold right now. I'm not going to share it to you with you guys until I do with them. Um, but we are in the stages of developing that so that we have an area where all of the information can be housed and shared um, so that we don't just have piecemeal everything. The next example that I'm gonna give you is a little bit different, and it's with freshwater mussels. Very similarly, it has a September 2018 um, listing determination date, and it has multiple data gaps as well, um, not just about the biology, but we catered these or the 12-month finding has impoundments, sedimentation, dewatering, sand and gravel mining, and chemical contaminants. Um, and then if you look at the four species that are coming up in 2018, those are three main rivers in Texas. So that covers a huge span of the area. And I'm going to go over these data gaps with you real fast. Too. So the first thing that we did was we funded a research project with Texas State University. Because we had the 12-month finding, one thing that we thought was important to do was sort of cater the 12-month finding, the needs found within the 12-month the finding um, to um, tolerance studies so that we could find those, those conservation actions that could be done by industry if necessary, or what was needed, what are the species needs. So if any conservation action comes, we can match those, if that makes sense, kind of like I discussed at the beginning of this presentation. For example, for with impoundments, um, water changes, the temperature changes um, before a dam and after dam. And you can sort of tell that by how deep water is. Once you dive in on a hot summer day, the top is usually really warm. The deeper it gets, the cooler it gets. So we did thermal tolerance. We also did dissolved oxygen because there is a change in the dynamics of the river itself with impoundments. For sedimentation, we did a turbidity tolerance study. So what is the level that they can tolerate? For dewatering, we did a desiccation study. For sand and gravel, turbidity as well. And for chemical contaminants, we did a, a study on ammonia to see what their tolerance was. So we really tried to cater the needs of what was found in the 12-month finding to any actions that could be taken into the future. We also funded a captive propagation program as well. During that time, we also had a nine-month educational program, and this was catered to stakeholders. Um, we wanted to reach out to everyone that um, would possibly be of interest to a potential listing decision so that they could have the information that they needed um, to make before any determination occurred. So the real goal of this program was really to be educational. The other benefit that happened is that we had Fish and Wildlife Service at every one of those meetings, and it developed a very nice communication path for Fish and Wildlife Service with a lot of those stakeholders, so they were able to discuss and communicate openly and freely. We were also able to coordinate with other agencies to make sure that the information was provided to the stakeholders, such as Parks and Wildlife and TCEQ. We focused um, a lot of those educational programs on water quality and water quantity and what was listed in the 12-month finding. So when we look at the plain spotted skunk, um, we have a timeline of 2022 and the SSA beginning in 2020. 
And um, I left the data gaps pretty vague because I think that we're going to go over some of those today. Um, and I didn't want to steal anyone's thunder. But I will say I also borrowed this map from Dollar, one of his presentation um, reports. But I also wanted to not really steal his thunder on that either. But I'm sure that you guys know the range of the species as well. So that's just sort of how we became interested in the plain spotted skunk in general. It has a huge range, um, an upcoming listing date, and there are um, data gaps. So the objective of this webinar, honestly, is to sort of brainstorm with you guys. I'm particularly interested in what your thoughts are and what your ideas are um, for additional research needs um, and any interested stakeholders that you think should be um, brought to the table. Um, I'd like to make sure that we understand all of the stakeholders' interests, um, agencies, um, nonprofits, researchers, all of them, so that we can bring them to the table. Um, I'd like to understand what future research needs are and identify potential conservation needs. So the whole goal is to sort of develop a community to discuss the research and work together with multiple stakeholders so we can inform Fish and Wildlife Service and we can achieve the goals that we set forth. So um, if you don't mind, I would really appreciate it if you would email me or um, call me and let me know what your thoughts are. We do have a survey at the end of this webinar, so when you log off this webinar, you should be presented with a survey. I'd really appreciate it if you would fill that out and let me know what your thoughts and needs are for the future so we can sort of develop that over time if that's something that you guys are interested in. And I'm just going to close out real fast. These are the other species that we do have um, as of currently at the Comptroller's office. So just a couple of them, if any of you guys know anyone else, Working with any of those species, I'd be happy to hear about it, um, sort of pull them to the table if they haven't already heard about us, and we can develop our own working groups in other areas as well. Most of these have work groups, but some of them don't. And the last part is this is my contact information. Um, please do email me any thoughts, suggestions, or ideas that you do have. Um, if you have any questions for this webinar, please do email the EGESM webinar at cpa.texas, and we can sort of bring those up in the roundtable discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on that. And that is all that I have to say for my presentation. Um, I'm going to change it over. Next, we have Shauna. She's with the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, let me just change this real fast for you. Um, she's with the Fish and Wildlife Service Biologist in the Missouri Ecological Services Field Office in Columbia, Missouri. She works with diverse partners on a variety of local, regional, and national efforts relating to listing, recovery, and consultation under the Endangered Species Act. She specializes in conservation of federally listed species with a current focus on mammals, including species of bats and the plain spotted skunk. So, Shauna, here you go. Thank you, Kimberly. Can you hear me okay? Yes, hear you perfectly. Great, thanks. Um, so thanks again for organizing the webinar, Kimberly. I know you um, worked quite, quite hard to put us all together in the same place at the same time. I think there's a lot of value for having these discussions um, early in the Fish and Wildlife Services listing consideration process. And um, Kimberly asked me here today to um, give an update on basically where we are in the listing process. I am the um, national recovery lead for the Plains Spotted Skunk and have been so for about five years now. Um, things have been fairly quiet uh, in terms of actions taken on Plains Spotted Skunk and we'll kind of take a look at why that is. As a general overview, um, our, I just wanted to show you where the steps in the listing process and kind of where we started with plain spotted skunk and um, where we're headed. And I'll go over each step in more detail. So uh, we were petitioned in 2012. Um, there are three steps to the listing consideration process. There's an, a 90 day, there's a 12 month finding, otherwise known as a status review and then if necessary we move on to a proposed rule um, and kind of go forward from there and then 
ultimately, as Kimberly mentioned, we have a decision that's due during fiscal year 22, which would be by September of 2022. So that's kind of our time frame where we started and where we are headed. So back in 2012, we were petitioned by a member of the public to list three what they uh, termed thicket species. Those were the plain spotted skunk, the prairie gray fox, and um, a distinct population segment, uh, that's DPS, apologize for the acronym, uh, Grand Prairie DPS of the Eastern Cottontail uh, was Marin's Cottontail. So that's what initiated our interest and analysis on those three species. And we were to move forward um, basically through that three-step process with all three of these species. And our first kind of consideration is whether or not what we were proposed to list is actually a listable entity. So it has to be in the case of subspecies, um, a recognized subspecies, and it has to meet um, criteria for being discrete and significant. So I won't go into a lot of detail. There's a lot of information out there on what those terms mean, but um, ultimately, plain spotted skunk and prairie gray fox were found to be, uh, we were able to consider them listable entities. However, we were not uh, able to consider Marin's Eastern Cottontail, that DPS, as a listable entity. So um, through that first filter, the cottontail was kicked out, and then from there forward, we were considering plain spotted skunk and prairie gray fox. So um, then we published the 90-day finding for spotted skunk and gray fox in December of 2012. Um, both of those were found to be subsistence substantial, meaning they move on to the next step. And again, Marin's cottontail was not substantial because it was not a listable entity. And both the prairie gray fox and the plain spotted skunk uh, went through a five-factor analysis. And this is a standard set of criteria that we evaluate for um, for multiple steps in the process, but certainly for the 90 day. And we are able to consider information at this stage only that we have in our files and in the petition. So at the 90 day finding, we do not go out to states and species experts. It's meant to be more of a quick evaluation uh, to determine if what we have in the petition is worth moving forward. Sometimes the petitions are so vague or um, there just isn't enough information to even understand what the petitioner was intending. So um, the five-factor analysis, we looked at um, present or threatened destruction, basically habitat issues. We looked at overutilization, disease, uh, what regulatory mechanisms exist. I think um, we're all fairly aware that that varies pretty widely from state to state throughout the range, and then understanding what the implications, if there are regulatory protections, what that does um, for the species, if it's adequate or not. And then kind of this other category, it's things that aren't necessarily covered in A through D, obviously, but we can look at um, direct mortality. Um, and we're kind of considering whether or not it affects individuals or populations. Um, but again, it's a limited amount of information that we are able to consider in the 90-day finding stage. So once we were through the 90-day finding, and I'm just going to basically speak about plain spotted skunk from here forward, um, prairie gray fox obviously went through its own five-factor analysis, and those factors were slightly different. Um, but it's moving forward at a, at a similar pace as plain spotted skunk, but I'm just talking about skunk from here forward. Um, so to be able to fit the species into our, our workload and um, to be able to establish a timeline for moving through the 12-month phase and then potential um, proposed listing rule if it's necessary into the future, um, the Fish and Wildlife Service undertook a species prioritization exercise, and this was um, for the suite of species that are on our table. We're, we're petitioned on a very regular basis to list species, and there are hundreds 
that we are in, in any region and some regions multiple hundreds that we're considering at any time. So we need to we needed to come up with a more transparent um, timeline and it just holders a bit of a heads up whenever we're asking for information. To be so this was um, an effort that the Fish and Wildlife Service undertook. Basically we are petitioned on a regular basis to list species and each region has hundreds of species that are in our queue. So we wanted to be more transparent. Uh, we wanted to be able to give our stakeholders and conservation partners a heads up so that um, they can prepare information to share with the Fish and Wildlife Service to inform our, our decision process. Um, and you may be familiar with this prioritization um, on some level if you're involved in threatened and endangered species, but we used a binning or um, kind of general categories to rate which species need to be addressed first and which ones could be addressed slightly later in our work plan. And in the end, the Fish and Wildlife Service set priorities and we finalized our work plan that covers the years 2017 to 2024. So it's a long-term work plan for our listing program. And here are the five bins. Um, so it goes from species that are the most critically imperiled, that's been one, and that would be um, species for which we need to take immediate action, um, down to new science underway for the third category, and then five is a, a limited category, limited data category where uh, we really can't make much of a decision, so we need to do a little bit more homework on our side and engage our partners to understand what that need actually is. So you have this um, gradient of different bins that um, we would insert our species into. And so for plain spotted skunk, it fell into bin three, which was the new science underway bin. Um, and the next action for that, uh, we already know is a 12 month finding and um, using our species status assessment framework to be able to complete that um, status review. Uh, again, Region 3 of the Fish and Wildlife Service is the lead region, and here in Missouri, we're the lead field office. Our time frame is 2022, and then um, we kind of have a pretty good idea of generally what states are involved in the, in the range, although the outline is probably a little more gray than I would be comfortable with. Okay, so next steps, um, moving on to the 12 month and a species status assessment or an SSA. I am currently not an SSA practitioner. Um, it's a framework that is being more broadly used across the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, but I wanted to give you just an overview of this process. It kind of um, gives some insight to where experts and states and people that currently have data or doing research can get involved in this evaluation process. So this is meant to be very general. Um, we'll be providing more information as we move forward in upcoming years. So um, the species status assessment, like I said, is a, is a framework for conducting status reviews. And we've always conducted status reviews as part of the listing process, but we haven't necessarily been consistent among our ESA programs or sometimes even within programs. If field offices within a region are all working on separate listing plans, we may have been um, using slightly different assessment methodologies. So the impetus for the SSA is part of a larger initiative to improve both efficiency and effectiveness of our ESA program. And it's meant to create a single unifying framework that all programs can use. So that's the efficiency part. And then in the end, we have the same goal. Um, we often use the same types of biological information. So really we should be using the same analytical framework. Um, we're one program, we should have one framework. So um, that's kind of the consistency aspect of this. And then it also improves the scientific rigor of our analyses and that addresses our effectiveness. So the more rigorous we can be up front, um, it does take more time. There are some more upfront costs, but we end up with a more robust analysis and we can in incorporate you know, general conservation principles along the way. 
And I'm just making sure that I'm covering the bases here. Like I said, it's not new. We've always done some version of status assessment, but just trying to be consistent, consistent and more rigorous. So the SSA is meant to provide foundational information for all of our TME programs. So it really kind of provides the building blocks for all of these other programs. So we have Section 7, that's consultation with federal agencies, candidate conservation, our five-year reviews that we um, that we do post-listing. So every five years after a species is listed, we are supposed to review the status and progress of recovery, um, making critical habitat decisions, and um, you know, Section 10, that's for private projects, so working on HCPs and mitigative efforts. So all of the different types of programs should be informed by a strong SSA, but it isn't a static process. So all of these um, building blocks, they provide information back to the SSA. So it's an iterative process. It's kind of a living analysis and not meant to be just a document or a flowchart that sits on the internet somewhere. So it's meant to be revisited. So what is an SSA? Uh, it's an analytical approach for assessing biological status. Uh, the broad stages um, have been identified of species needs, current condition, and viability. So for species needs, we evaluate the species biological and ecological requisites for viability. And that means that we have to have the understanding of what it takes for a species to persist over the long term. And this evaluation requires an in-depth understanding of the biology of the species we are assessing. So that one is fairly obvious. For the current condition, we're evaluating what we understand in this moment or at the time we're moving through the listing process. We evaluate what, re what resources are available to individuals, how populations are distributed, and how many there are. So it includes a historical perspective and kind of what that means is how do the current conditions relate to historical conditions? So are we seeing trends and increases or decreases through time? And for viability, uh, part of that is that we're projecting future condition in terms of number, distribution, and health of populations, given various plausible future scenarios. And then we're pulling it all together into a synthesis of how viability has changed over time and how it is anticipated to change into the future. So I'm gonna cover these steps a little bit more in depth, but first I wanted to explain a little bit more about viability. It's such a um, fundamental part of this analysis. So we use the conservation principles of resiliency, representation, and redundancy. Perhaps have heard of the three Rs, and we use that to characterize viability of a species. Uh, when these are combined across populations, they measure the health of the species as a whole. The more we can identify and break down the constituent elements contributing to resiliency, representation, and redundancy, the better we can understand what contributes to and is necessary for the long-term health of a species. So resiliency can be measured in terms of, uh, for example, abundance, habitat quality, and availability, or productivity. Redundancy can be measured in terms of number and distribution of populations, uh, particularly in relation to potential catastrophic events. So we don't really want to put all of our eggs in one basket. So that's the kind of thing that we think about there. And then representation can be measured in terms of genetic variability, but also behavioral, physiological, or ecological diversity. And you can see that the three R's are interconnected and overlapping. For example, populations must be resilient in order to contribute to redundancy or representation. And likewise, redundant populations within the representative genotype or ecological setting contribute to the maintenance of the representation contributing to the species adaptive and evolutionary capacity. So we don't just look at one um, individually, we definitely look at the interplay among those three different um, aspects of viability. So just to sum it up, uh, viability for a species is the ability of a species to maintain multiple self-sustaining populations across the full gradient of adaptive diversity of the species. And the SSA process 
um, is intended to characterize a species degree of viability over time, and it does not analyze whether or not a species is or is not viable. So it's looking at degree, it's not binary. Um, we can look at um, how viable it could be with those future predictions. Okay, now I'm gonna go back to the three stages of the SSA. So for species needs, we consider those needs at the individual, the population, and the species level. Um, generally speaking, for individuals, we look at the life history needs of individuals for breeding, feeding, sheltering, and reproduction, and we do that for all life stages. For populations, we look at the demographic and habitat needs of a healthy population, um, information such as vital rates and habitat type, quantity and quality needed for a healthy population. And at the species level, we look at what is needed to sustain the species into the future. So how many healthy populations and in what spatial arrangement is needed to sustain the species. In stage two current condition, we try to answer the question, what is the current status of the species needs as identified in the first stage? So how many populations do we have now compared to historically? What are, where are those populations and how are they distributed um, compared to historical distribution and how healthy are the populations? Um, we also look at what is missing or diminished and why. So what is causing the species to be in its current condition and how is that affecting the species? And then lastly, with viability, we sum up this information and characterize the species viability. So we analyze future scenarios, considering the threats and conservation efforts into the future. We forecast the number and distribution of healthy populations into the future. And then the synthesis brings it all together. So what does it mean for the species? Given its past, current, and future conditions, how does the species viability in terms of the three R's change over time? So I kind of presented this in a linear fashion because it's just easier to explain that way. But as I mentioned before, there, it's an iterative process. So we're working on all three stages at the same time and then kind of going back and forth among the stages as we move through the process because we might learn something in working on one stage like current condition in stage two that could be helpful um, if we didn't consider it in stage one when we're considering species needs. So in terms of where states and species experts can fit into this process, um, an important part is that we will be able to use all the available information that's relevant to conducting evaluation. So for the plain spotted skunk, I'm already and I have already received information from some states over the last couple of years since I've been the lead. Um, but an important part of the early SSA process is to compile a larger body and more complete body of information for the species. And this is going to include published literature um, and additional information or studies that are ongoing now or that will be started before we have to make our listing decision. Um, specifically, location data are helpful to conduct the redundancy and representation evaluation, so you'll likely be seeing a request for any available location data that you might be willing to share. And then we'll also seek input from experts on various aspects of the analysis, such as the evaluation of future conditions and species needs. And then once we have the SSA report drafted, um, the intent is to send it to species experts and state counterparts for review um, before we consider that a final document. So there really are multiple points at which um, experts can be involved and that will engage the states in this process. So we're at the 12 month finding stage. Uh, we're Basically, that is where we will be headed next. And then after that, um, if it's applicable, then we'll look to draft um, a proposed listing rule. And then um, at this point, part of the process um, is to consider a critical habitat proposal. So next for us specifically, um, I think Kimberly mentioned this also, that the SSA will begin in fiscal year 2020, which is two years before we have to make that decision date in FY22. 
Um, and so I've, I've provided some general SSA information today, and we'll just have to provide more detailed information um, once we kick off the SSA. And we're coordinating priority research, um, identifying data needs. We're going to hear about some um, ongoing research today that will be really helpful. Um, any information that we can inform threats analysis, so that five-factor analysis, those types of pieces of information will still be used in the SSA, but just in a basically different style of framework. And then we should also be thinking about uh, proactive measures, proactive conservation that could alleviate those threats with the idea that perhaps we could preclude listing. So we don't want to add things to the list if it's not necessary, but um, taking action now since we have a little bit of time, although the, the clock is certainly running, um, but that's an option at this point too. So I think um, this group would have some valuable insight there as well. So I managed to stay on the phone for the rest of the time. That's all that I have. Um, as Kimberly mentioned, if you have questions, you can mail email them to the address she provided or certainly uh, feel free to email me directly. And there's my Fish and Wildlife Service email address there. I appreciate the time. Thanks, Kimberly. Thank you so much for your presentation. Next up, we're going to have um, someone who I don't think really needs an introduction. I think you guys all know him. It's Dr. Dowler. Dr. Dollar has been a professor of biology at Angelo State University for over 25 years. He and his students have focused much of their research on skunks in Texas over the past decade. Co-authors on the presentation are Clint Perkins and Alexander Schaefer. Thank you all for um, attending this webinar and especially thank the uh, Texas Comptroller's Office for their assistance in putting it all together so that we could share some of our data with uh, all of you. Uh, this project uh, ran about two and a half years and uh, two people that were instrumental and were the co-authors on this uh, presentation, Clint Perkins and Alexander Schaefer, both of them are going to be presenting their own um, uh, presentations on aspects of the study uh, right after I introduce it and cover some of the survey techniques and some of the results uh, dealing with that. So, most of you know this animal already, Spilogeo putorius interrupta is the plain spotted skunk. It's a small mesocarnivore, about half a kilogram in uh, size, and with this distinctive spotting pattern or broken uh, stripes across the black background of the body. Uh, the taxonomy of this group, uh, this particular species has been broken into three subspecies. The uh, plain spotted skunk, which we will be dealing the most with today, and the Appalachian uh, subspecies in the eastern part of the U.S., and then the Florida subspecies, which is in the panhandle, excuse me, the, the uh, peninsular portion of, um, of Florida. So uh, how we uh, came to be interested in this particular species is uh, back in uh, 2006 and 2007, uh, we uh, were able to salvage some roadkill specimens that are uh, were in the central part of the state in a region that uh, previously uh, eastern spotted skunks had not been reported. And we put together a, a paper dealing with uh, the current distribution based on museum records and uh, observed locations back in 2008. So uh, one of the things that you'll see from this is that the eastern half of the state essentially in the panhandle is the distribution for eastern spotted skunks. Uh, but we also have the western spotted skunks, Bilogale gracilis, uh, in the state as well. And there are some purported areas of sympatry, although we, we have found no evidence that there is hybridization occurring between the two. Uh, the problem with uh, this species and the reason that we are uh, all interested in it is that uh, there is very good evidence uh, provided by Gomper and Hack in 2005 that a population decline began in the 1940s. The uh, based on uh, fur harvest records, the uh, reasons for the decline are uh, certainly speculative, and there's uh, more than I've listed here. But habitat alteration, including the conversion of modern um, uh, farming practices from small local farms to corporate uh, farms 
um, has certainly played a role. Uh, some have argued that pesticide applications, including DET, might have uh, uh, increased mortality. And uh, disease outbreaks and certainly over harvest is another possible um, explanation for this, or it could be a, a combination of, of several of these. Here in Texas, um, we couldn't take the same approach as Gomper and Hackett in uh, looking at harvest records because we have both species, western and eastern spotted skunks in the states, and the surveys simply said civet cat or uh, spotted skunk and didn't distinguish between the two. So it makes it difficult to address the uh, that decline, at least with uh, the eastern spotted skunk. Uh, as we've already heard, it, it is being considered for federal listing under the Endangered Species Act. And in Texas, it's treated as a species of greatest conservation need. The um, objectives that we had at the beginning of the study were uh, to begin with, to create a comprehensive review of the, the conservation status of the species, to survey likely sites of its occurrence and determine the efficacy of, of different survey techniques for detecting them. Uh, ultimately, with the surveys to identify the current um, populations of eastern spotted skunks and uh, hopefully find areas uh, with high localized abundance. Uh, as Clint Perkins will uh, describe later after this presentation, uh, we also uh, were hoping to model the uh, areas of the state with the highest likelihood of occurrence uh, based on the data that we could, could collect. And lastly, as Alex Schaefer will talk about in a moment, uh, we were examining the genetic variability both among populations here in Texas and uh, among subspecies themselves. So uh, we began our study by taking museum records for plain spotted skunk in Texas and with the assistance of uh, Brad Walliver and his group at the University of Texas, uh, produced a, a species distribution model to assist us in, in determining what sites would be best for sampling. Um, they also uh, looked at uh, remnant core habitat uh, by mapping that. And on the basis of these things, we chose 10 counties in the state to uh, to do our field sampling. Uh, those counties uh, stretching from Wichita in the north to Clayburg in the south uh, cover much of the uh, suggested distribution of the species in East Texas. Uh, our survey methods involved using three devices. Uh, those were track plates, live traps, and trail cameras, which I'll describe in a moment. Uh, we used 120 devices at each site, uh, 40 of each, and placed these 100 meters apart. And we uh, utilized those for a seven night period, uh, stretched over a 10 day period for setting up and taking down the entire uh, array of, of sampling devices. So for live traps, we used tomahawk live traps, uh, as you see here. Uh, we covered those with burlap, and generally uh, within uh, 10 meters or so of the uh, point, we selected a site that was had the thickest available cover. We uh, baited these with a canned fish product called chub mackerel. Our track plates were designed after Zelensky et al. and Hackett et al., uh, ones that had previously previously been used on mesocarnivores. Uh, they're a coroplast enclosure uh, with toner used in the front part of that and uh, contact paper in the back for recording uh, tracks. We um, uh, did two modifications. One, we decreased the size uh, of the opening to match that of our tomahawk traps, thinking that we might exclude raccoons and uh, larger uh, mesocarnivores. And we also, half of those, we uh, placed a hair snare um, halfway down the, the length of the enclosure uh, in order to capture hair for DNA analysis. The, uh, these two were baited with uh, the chub mackerel. Uh, the trail cameras that we used were Bushnell uh, trophy cams and Reconyx uh, hyperfire cameras. Uh, these were baited with cans of sardines 
or uh, commercial fish oil. And they were set to take a maximum amount of photos per trigger event. Uh, one of the things that came up soon after we uh, began was that uh, we thought there may well be more records out there uh, if we could uh, get the word out uh, about our study. And so starting in January of 2016, we began to solicit uh, observations from the public. Uh, we did some presentations uh, to groups like uh, Texas Master Naturalists. We also um, uh, participated in a feature article in Texas Parks and Wildlife Magazine in which we uh, described our study and put a uh, an email address for the public to contact us that was dedicated to the project. And we also uh, began an iNaturalist uh, project. The um, Probably the, the most uh, successful thing we did was putting out a wanted, a wanted poster for information on, on species. And we did email blasts to several organizations, including the Texas Society of Mammalogists and the, and the Master Naturalist Program, as well as the Texas Chapter of the Wildlife Society and uh, a group of uh, wildlife rehab uh, people in the state. This was also posted on uh, Facebook and uh, many of our collaborators also distributed it widely. So one thing you might uh, ask about um, this kind of um, soliciting observations from the public is how do you verify those? And, and in many cases, if it's a picture, it's uh, fairly easy. Uh, this, for example, uh, was one that was submitted and it's uh, an obvious western spotted skunk, not a plain spotted skunk. Uh, the reason you can tell that is from the uh, that size of that spot on the forehead. Um, in some cases, uh, specific behaviors might be described by people contacting us. For example, the, the handstand behavior that's uh, so well known uh, in spotted skunks. So uh, in addition to that, we also involve citizen scientists in some additional camera surveys uh, between uh, fall of 2016 and spring of 2017, we uh, surveyed an additional six counties at nine locations, and uh, we had these cameras up for uh, three-week periods, and uh, the public citizen scientists did the checking and rebating uh, of those for us, again, to try and increase the, the likelihood of detecting uh, the skunks. So the results of our field survey. Um, we again began uh, surveying in September of 2015 and, and finished in January of this year. The uh, total number of devices deployed um, stretched over 8,080 8, device nights. Um, and of those 8,000 plus nights, uh, we ended up having a total of 12 detections occurring in four counties. That was Coriel, Harris, Walmart, and Wise. And our overall detection rate was only 0 0.15, the, which comes out to a single skunk per uh, 672 survey nights. But all of our survey devices did detect skunks. Um, one of the things we looked at was uh, in terms of the efficacy of our devices, where whether they remained operational in the field. And as you can see here, cameras were by far the most successful in terms of staying functional. Uh, during the seven day trapping or uh, sampling period. Uh, track plates were next and traps were the least with 59% of those. And for both track plates and traps, we we found that other mesocarnivores, raccoons in particular, uh, were um, had major interference with uh, the devices. Uh, and we also had non-target captures in, uh, in many of the tomahawks. So as far as um, our ability to detect them, they were spread, as I mentioned before, in all, all devices. We had six uh, captures and traps, four detections by cameras, and uh, only two in the track plates. Um, so uh, with those sample sizes, there was obviously no, um, no difference among the, uh, the three methods. Uh, one of the other things we looked at was how quickly do you detect a spotted skunk? 
uh, using the devices and with all of them they ranged from uh, a mean of two days in traps or 1.5 in, in cameras to uh, over five in, in the track plates. But again, the sample size is so low that uh, uh, these uh, probably do not mean, mean a lot. Um, for the citizen science uh, camera surveys, so we uh, ended up deploying another 54 cameras over 1,200 more nights, and we ended up uh, getting it to four detections, additional detections, two of which were unique um, uh, using the citizen science approach. And probably the most successful thing was our crowdsourcing efforts in which uh, getting the word out and asking for the public to, and professionals, I should say, uh, to uh, help with, with our research uh, resulted in an additional uh, 80 total records, uh, 56 of which were unique. Uh, those were from 19 different counties, of which four uh, spotted skunks or uh, eastern spotted skunks had not been reported prior to that. And one researcher, um, uh, Charles Beacons at uh, Fort Hood, had a study of bobcats in which they had 48 uh, recorded spotted skunk images, including this one, and uh, 28 of those uh, seemed to be unique uh, individuals. Um, we continued to survey uh, museums and ended up with, uh, since the year 2016, uh, museum records from nine counties. We ended up with 25 uh, observations from 14 counties uh, based on our wanted poster and then the ones that I just mentioned from Fort Hood. Um, <clears throat> And in general, uh, instead of four counties based on our, our field effort, uh, we ended up with a total of 23 counties uh, that ranged over five eco regions. Two of those cross timbers and uh, the Gulf Prairie region uh, had areas of high, uh, high numbers of observations. And those are <clears throat> again here and um, this part of the state and then down on the Gulf. Um, the area of Houston or Waller, uh, excuse me, Harris County, uh, where Houston is, and Waller County adjacent to it. Uh, overall, our detection rates were incredibly low, 0.15 percent, but that uh, is comparable to what has been seen in the past. Uh, in Missouri and Arkansas, for example, uh, we're, we're short of those, but higher than what has been reported for Tennessee. If you take the individual counties that did have uh, detections, uh, we are, again, ranging from 0 0.26 to 0 0.73, which is right in uh, the same range given for uh, previous studies. Uh, we did find that track plates were not as efficient as previously reported. We think this is because of our modifications that I mentioned. Uh, this is a test <clears throat> run that we did prior to the beginning of the study, and this is a western spotted skunk here in, in West Texas. And this is what we think happened in most cases. The, the skunk investigated the enclosure, took one step and left a track, uh, but did not go in. Uh, we had no incidences of spotted skunks going completely through under our um, uh, hair snares or even without the hair snares going all the way into the enclosures for the bait. Uh, so by far the trail cameras uh, seem to be the best. Uh, in terms of number of uh, detections uh, and uh, their oper uh, being operational. Uh, live traps did very well for us as well, um, but we suggest that uh, cameras probably have the greatest potential um, in the future. Uh, as far as the uh, conclusions, we, we believe plain spider skunk is still widely distributed in Texas uh, based on uh, the results of our study. Two areas, Fort Hood and uh, the Katy Prairie region outside of Houston, uh, seem to have very good populations. Uh, all the ones that we sampled did have uh, cattle present, uh, and the uh, skunks were you know, uh, starkly different uh, habitats from prairie to juniper forest to uh, pasture with prickly pear and mesquite. <clears throat> so, the uh, biggest problem we ran into is uh, the uh, interference with other mesocarnivores uh, and 
and in some sites, at some sites, that was a, a very serious problem. Uh, but in general, our traps and cameras performed according to uh, uh, similar to a previous research, and our track plates uh, did not. Uh, for the future, we would suggest uh, continuing to work with citizen scientists. We were uh, excited about the, the fact that, that did uh, work for us, and um, going outside to um, uh, solicit observations uh, also was very successful for us. And we hope, uh, and potentially in the future, to look at those two populations of Fort Hood and Katy Prairie to better understand these the biology of the of plain spotted skunks. So with that, I'll um, acknowledge, especially the Texas Comptroller's Office for Funding and Angela State University. Uh, we had a technical advisory panel made up of Jerry Dragoo, John Cargis, Amy Truer, Kane, and Damon Lesmeister. Uh, and then uh, colleagues again, Brad Walliver, John Paul Peter, and Ben LeBay at uh, University of Texas. And then many of the uh, places that um, we were able to, to use as sites and uh, many other people that played a very important role. And with that, I will, uh, we can move to the next uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dollar. Next up, we'll have Clint Perkins. Clint got his bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, Alexandria, and has completed his master's degree this month at Angela State University. In addition to his academic studies, he has worked on several wildlife biology projects with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and other federal agencies. This presentation is co-authored with Alexandra Schaefer and Robert Dowler from Angela State University and by Brad Walliver, John Paul Pierre, and Ben LeBay from the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Clint Perkins, and today I'm going to talk about the distribution of the plain spotted skunk in Texas and some of the factors affecting its distribution. Before I get started, I want to thank you all for attending today's webinar and the Texas Comptroller's Office of Public Accounts for hosting today's events. I want to start by briefly outlining what I'll be talking about today. First, I will examine the current distribution of the plain spotted skunk in Texas. Next, I will look at the impacts of urbanization and oil and gas infrastructure on the distribution of the skunk. I will also examine the skunk's usage and avoidance of land cover types at two study sites. And finally, I'll wrap everything up in the discussion. While we know that the plain spotted skunk was historically widespread in Texas, all we know about its habitat associations is very general. For instance, we know that the skunk was found in prairies, forests, and riparian zones historically, but we don't know what type of forests or prairies. This map, recreated from Dallas et al. 2008, shows the distribution of the genus Spilogale in Texas. It was created using known museum records of both the eastern and western spotted skunk in Texas. The range of the plain spotted skunk is noted in blue, while the western spotted skunk is in purple. The counties in white represent an overlap zone where records of both species exist. Once again, from Dallas et al., the red colored counties rep represented here are those with a county record. While this shows that the skunk was historically present in nine of the 10 eco regions in Texas, there is an obvious concentration in the central part of the state. This core area is comprised of four of the ecoregions. The Coastal Prairie Ecoregion, the Post Oak Savanna Ecoregion, the Blackland Prairie Soils Ecoregion, and the Cross Timbers Ecoregion. Species distribution modeling is a method used to relate presence or presence absence data to environmental variables. These variables can include bioclimatic variables, topographic variables, soil type, wetland density and occurrence, or land cover variables. It is, it is important to note that there are a multitude of different environmental layers out there for utilization and analysis. It is incumbent upon the researcher to utilize layers that are germane to their study species. Maxent, or maximum entropy modeling, 
is a useful form of species distribution model, mostly because this is a machine learning method that is very robust with small sample sizes. Without getting into too much detail, Maxent uses three different inputs to create a model. The first are back po background points that are added by the program. The second is environmental layers, which are decided upon and added by the researcher. And the final is the presence data itself. The output is a series of cells. For this study, the scale was approximately one kilometer by one kilometer. Um, with each cell within the study area having a relative probability of presence. This output is visually represented by a heat map where the cooler colors represent a lower probability of presence and the warmer colors represent a higher probability of presence. As an example, I have attached this raw SDM heat map. This map utilizes historical museum data and is not really germane to today's talk other than as an example of the output. The most important thing to note is that all of the cells in this map have a probability of presence. However, we know this raw output, especially with the lower percentages, may not accurately reflect presence. So researchers often recalculate the cell values and remove all of those cells below a certain threshold. 50% is a very commonly used threshold and is in fact the threshold used when creating this preliminary species distribution model. This model was created at the start of the project using the historical museum records and eventually it was used to direct field surveys for the plain spotted skunk. Here I've taken both the, uh, the historical county records and placed it next to the species distribution model. As you can see, the model does a good job of predicting presence in the core region of the state. The objectives for this presentation are to first detail the distribution of the plain spotted skunk in Texas. Next, I will analyze the land cover uh, alteration that could impact the skunk's distribution. And finally, I will examine land cover type usage versus avoidance at two study sites. And here we're just going to move on to the species distribution model. So I utilized the most recent version of Maxent when creating this model. I decided to use Texas as the study area rather than the range reported in Dallar et al. 2008. I used a 2K fold cross validation method for this model. And this means that I randomly split the presence data equally into both a training and a test data set. The training data were used to create the model. The test data were used to compare how well the model performed. Finally, there was a spatial or redundancy performed. Uh, this was uh, uh, the uh, occurrence of multiple records of individual at individual locations. I utilized the most recent version of Maxent when creating this model. I decided to use Texas as the study area rather than the range reported in Dallar et al. 2008. I used a 2K fold cross validation method. This means that I randomly split the presence data equally into both a training and test data set. The training data were used to create the model. The test data were used to compare how well the model performed. Finally, there was spatial redundancy in the presence data. And this was found in multiple records at individual locations. To count for this bias, I randomly filtered the records at two locations of high local abundance. I utilized a one kilometer scale for my cell size, and this was because uh, it was the scale of my course's environmental layer. I used two topographic layers, aspect and slope, and 18 bioclimatic variables. I also use the 2011 uh, National Land Base Cover, the National Land Cover Database. In this database, Texas has 15 different land cover layers. 
However, I truncated these down to nine layers based upon perceived importance to the scholar. Here's a brief review of the presence data from this project. At the time the model was created, we had 114 verified records from 26 counties. There were also two areas of high localized uh, abundance identified. The first area was at Fort Hood military installation in Correo and Bell counties. At this location, we had 51 verified plain spotted skunk observations, three of which were due to our survey efforts. The remaining 48 came from a long-term Bobcat trail camera survey performed by Charles Pickens, a biologist at the installation. The second area of high local abundance was at Katy Prairie in Harris and Waller counties. There were 25 verified records of plain spotted skunks at this location. Presence data came from two surveys, one citizen scientist trail camera survey, museum records, and animal rehab records. So here is the species distribution model that uh, was created. Remember that this map has been recalculated to only show cells with a relative probability of occurrence greater than 50%. The cold to hot change in colors indicates an increase in the probability of occurrence. This model predicts that the skunk is still widely distributed in the central portion of Texas. This graph shows uh, the area under the curve and is a way to show model validation. An AUC score of 0.7 to 0.9 would be average to above average. An AUC score of 0.9 to 1 would be good to great. The scores netted by the model indicate that it is above average, but could use further refinement. The Cross Timbers ecoregion has the highest mean probability of occurrence. This is likely due to this ecoregion having the most presence data input into the model. Although there were many records from Fort Hood, there were nine additional records evenly distributed throughout this ecoregion. The model indicates that forest land cover is important to plain spotted skunk. This result is no doubt due to the inputs from this region. The model also predicted a high probability of presence along the edge of the Edwards Plateau. There are historical records of plain spotted skunk from this region, but no current records were found. Also, because this area is part of the overlap zone with the western spotted skunk, it was not serving. The I-35 corridor between Austin and San Antonio is also found in this region. This area currently has high rates of development and urbanization. These factors could impact the plain spotted skunk distribution as well as the ability to locate its presence. So we ended up with 25 counties with a probability of presence of greater than 50%. This equated to a little over 55,000 square kilometers. Uh, the skunk, we actually had skunk presence data from 10 of these counties, but only two of those were surveyed. Models are only as good as the information that is input into it. A bias in uh, historical museum records and how these records were collected uh, can result in bias in species distribution models, which can eventually lead to bias in survey locations. Crowdsourcing, which is the way we ended up getting most of the presence data for this project is biased towards areas with ongoing research and or large cities. To wit, this is why I had to filter the uh, data set to remove the bias from the areas of Fort Hood and Katy Prairie, or at least attempt to do so. Now I'm going to move on to the landscape alteration portion of the presentation. Before I get started, 
It is important to note that this portion of the project was completed by my co-authors at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Unfortunately, they could not participate in today's webinar, so I'm going to fill in. This analysis here was performed at the beginning of the project and helped in choosing our study caddies. Alteration types included oil and gas, urbanization, road development, and agricultural expansion. Using different techniques for each of these four factors, the co-authors were able to quantify the amount of alteration per county. As expected, Harris and Tarrant counties were the most altered. For those outside of Texas, these two counties are the location of Houston and Fort Worth. The change in these counties was primarily from urbanization, although gas development played a small role in Tarrant County. What we see here is the total habitat alteration in Harris County by the four different factors. It is important to note that this technique does not show the portions of Houston that were previously urbanized, only the more recent change. This is why in the map to the top left, there is a large hollow area in the center of Harris County. In Northwest Harris County, you can see the Katy Prairie Conservancy lands, as well as the multitude of habitat that has recently been lost adjacent to these lands. This map shows areas of possible future oil and gas land cover alteration. Uh, and it's indicated by blue cells. The Barrett Shale play is important to note because this play is the same spatial extent as the Cross Timbers ecoregion, which has a high relative probability of, of occurrence throughout. There is a lack of predicted future development in the central portion of the state. Overall, it appears as if the distribution of the plain spotted skunk could be impacted by oil and gas extraction in the Cross Timbers ecoregion. However, additional research is needed to improve our understanding between the oil and gas development and the plain spotted skunk's response. Finally, we have the effects of future urbanization upon plain spotted skunks in Texas. On this map, the color red represents the current urbanization and the color blue represents future urbanization. Recent, recent skunk localities are also noted. The current and forecasted urbanization near Houston and Dallas-Fort Worth are particularly ominous. The I-35 corridor between San Antonio and Austin is also of note because of the high predictive relative probability of occurrence in this area. Finally, it appears that low density, low density urbanization may not adversely affect the species due to the current localities and rural areas throughout the state. All right, I will now discuss the land cover usage analysis. There was a need to examine some of the habitat parameters at the locations where we were finding uh, spotted skunks. We recorded multiple vegetative characteristics at each survey site, including ground cover, uh, canopy density, and visual obstruction. However, due to the small sample size, I decided to utilize a coarser analysis. Although even this coarser analysis suffers from the same small sample size. This analysis analyzes the proportion of land cover types within the study area to the proportion of land cover types within a skunk's home range. From this analysis, we can quantify whether the skunks are utilizing or avoiding certain land cover types. For this analysis, I used the 2011 National Land Cover Database. Layers were truncated based upon the site. The home range was decided was defined as the average home range of male plain spotted skunks observed recently during the fall in Arkansas. This equated to a buffer of slightly less than one kilometer around each detection point. 
The study area was defined as a 10 kilometer buffer around the central point of each survey location. A chi-square test was utilized to find differences between the proportion of land cover types in the home range compared to the study area. Post hoc analysis revealed differences between the land cover types. This analysis performed using survey detection points at Katy Prairie and Fort Hood. And here, I just wanted to give you all a visual representation of these two habitats. On the left is the, uh, the open landscape at Katy Prairie, and on the right is the ash juniper forest we observed at Fort Hood. At Katy Prairie, we had seven total detections available for analysis. A chi-square test revealed that there is a difference in the land cover types in this gulf's home range compared to the overall study area. At this site, plains and spotted skunks are utilizing pasture and grassland habitats at a greater than expected frequency. Pasture and grassland made up 84% of the skunk's home range land cover type. However, the land cover only accounted for 68% of the study area. This indicates that at this location, pastures and grassland cover types are important for plain spotted skunks. At Fort Hood, there were three detections available for analysis. A chi-square test revealed that there is a difference in the land cover types in the home range compared to the study area. At this site, plain spotted skunks are utilizing evergreen and deciduous spores at a greater than expected frequency. They are also avoiding pasture and grassland cover at a higher frequency than expected. This indicates that at Fort Hood, the ash juniper and mixed oak forests are important for the plain spotted skunks, while pasture and grasslands may have a negative impact on the skunk. I would first like to reiterate our objectives and findings as we move to this discussion. The first objective was to model the skunk's current distribution in Texas. I found that the skunk's distribution is primary in five ecoregions within the central portion of the state. This core area is made up of the following ecoregions, the Gulf Coast prairies, the Blackland prairie soils, the post oak savanna, the cross timbers, and the rolling plains ecoregions. The second objective was to analyze the effects of oil and gas infrastructure upon the distribution of the skunk. Currently, this relationship is not fully understood. The Barnett Shale play could be pertinent because this play could impact the distribution in the rolling plains and cross timbers ecoregions. However, future research is needed to fully understand the relationship between oil and gas extraction and the plain spotted skunk. The third objective was to analyze the current and future effects of urbanization on the plain spotted skunk. Future urbanization in Dallas, Tarrant, Harris, and Waller counties will impact the plain spotted skunk distribution. It is unknown if the expansion along the I-35 corridor will impact the skunk. It also appears that low density urbanization in lower air in rural areas will not have an impact upon the skunk's distribution. The final objective was to analyze land cover usage at two sites. The skunks are utilizing two different land cover types at these sites. At Fort Hood, they are primarily using evergreen and deciduous forests while avoiding pastures and grasslands. At Katy Prairie, they are primarily using pastures and grasslands. There is rapid expansion currently underway along the I-35 corridor between San Antonio and Austin. Although this area was not surveyed, the model predicted a high probability of relative occurrence in this area. While this may be an error of commission, if the plain spotted skunk is present in this area, Future urbanization and de excuse me and development would certainly limit distribution. 
At Katy Prairie, the skunk was found on both hunter and private land. The skunk was found in areas that had been restored back to the tall grass prairies native to the area. Both locations had low intensity grazing regimes and the periodic use of fire as a management strategy. The NLCD indicated that most of this land was pasture, but these locations were actually fairly pristine prairies. At Fort Hood, the plain spotted skunk is utilizing the mixed ash juniper and oak forests while avoiding pasture and grassland habitats. The grasslands at Fort Hood, however, are not tall grass prairies like those seen in Harris or Waller County and can be heavily disturbed due to training exercises. This could be why the skunk is utilizing forest habitats rather than prairies. However, Les Meister et al. found that plain spotted skunks selectively use early successional deciduous and evergreen forests and avoid open grassland habitats. Looking forward, I recommend that research be conducted at two scales, one range-wide and the other locally. Range-wide, additional information is still needed to validate and refine the model and define the extent of the skunk's range, especially along the I-35 corridor. At this scale, additional research can be used to provide occupancy and abundance analysis. Research at this level should be conducted with trail cameras and crowdsource efforts. On a local level, research is needed to examine population demographics, as well as habitat associations and general ecology. This research should be conducted with radio collared skunks at one or both of the two areas of high local abundance. I would like to thank and acknowledge our funding source, the Texas Comptroller's Office and Angelo State University. I would like also like to thank all of the landowners and land managers who provided property access for our surveys. Next, I would like to thank our technical advisory panel for providing input these last few years. I would also personally like to thank my thesis committee. I'd also like to acknowledge three people, Fred Collins, Jonah Evans, and Bonnie Gulis, well, Rob Luski, who each had major inputs into the study. I would like to thank and acknowledge all of the collaborators, contributors, and citizen scientists who participated in this study and helped provide presence data. Finally, I'd like to thank all of the Angelo State volunteers who came out on the weekends and helped set out all of the detection devices at each site. Thank you, and we'll now move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Clint, and congratulations on getting your master's. Next up, we have Alexandra Schaefer, and she has her bachelor's degree from California State University, Long Beach, and completed her master's degree in June of this year at Angela State University. Her thesis research focused on molecular approaches to understanding the conservation genetics of the eastern spotted skunk. The presentation is co-authored by Lauren Ammerman, Dr. D uh, Robert Dowler, and Clint Perkins of Angela State University. Thank you everybody for being here. So you've already heard a little bit about our surveys for the plain spotted skunk and distribution of the species in the state of Texas from both Bob and Clint. I'm just going to detour a little bit into the genetics of the species, focusing on a different aspect of the same project that we all worked on together in Texas. So, spotted skunks, as you all know, are relatively uncommon carnivores in the skunk family Mephidity. There are currently four recognized species of spotted skunks. The first two of which occur largely throughout the United States and include the western spotted skunk, Phylogale gracilis, and the eastern spotted skunk, Phylogale putorius. However, there's also the southern spotted skunk, Phylogale angustifrons, that occurs largely throughout Central America. And finally, the pygmy spotted skunk that is endemic to Mexico and occurs largely along that Pacific coastline. However, within the eastern spotted skunk are species of interest. There are currently three recognized subspecies. 
the plains spotted skunk, Phyllogale pitorius interrupta, is distributed largely throughout the Great Plains of the United States and does have the largest distribution of any of the three subspecies. The Appalachian spotted skunk occurs in the East Coast and is largely associated with the Appalachian mountain range. And finally, the Florida spotted skunk, Phyllogale pitorius ambarbalis, and only occurs throughout the peninsular region of Florida. To date, these three subspecies designations are only upheld by morphological differences among the skunks, which include variation in color pattern and size. The plains spotted skunk has the least amount of white overall, as noted by the relative width of the dorsal and lateral stripes. The smaller size of the triangular um, forehead patch and the absence of white or reduction of white at the tip of the tail in comparison to the Appalachian and Florida skunks. However, the Florida subspecies is the smallest of all three with adult males achieving weights of only about three to 350 grams, whereas Plains and Appalachian individuals um, range anywhere from six to 800 grams. Currently, the Eastern Spotted Skunk as a whole is listed as vulnerable by the IUCN, with the Plains Spotted Skunk in particular currently being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. At a more local level, many states already consider the Eastern Spotted Skunk endangered, threatened, or imperiled, and in the state of Texas, it's considered a species of greatest conservation need. However, despite all of these status designations, there remains an absence of genetic data for the Eastern Spotted Skunk. Therefore, the objectives of our study were to test the validity of these three subspecies designations using the molecular methods, um, in particular cytochrome B sequences from the mitochondrial genome and microsatellite markers from the nuclear genome. Additionally, we wanted to compare the levels of genetic variability among the three subspecies. Because our project was largely funded through the Texas Comptroller's Office, thank you everybody. Um, all of our field work was conducted in the state of Texas, um, 10 counties in particular highlighted in red on that county map for you. We utilized three devices that have already been laid out for you, but briefly, um, live traps, track plates, and game cameras where we monitored them um, every single day. And when we did trap spotted skunks in order to obtain um, tissue for genetic analysis, we anesthetized them in order to get an ear clip and a, a hair sample for extraction. However, due to the lack of tissues we were able to obtain in our field work, we also um, supplemented that through museum loans for tissues. A lot of colleagues and researchers working on spotted skunks throughout the United States donated tissues for this analysis. And thank you if you're listening in. Um, we salvaged road kills whenever possible, and we also obtained some fur trapper harvest. All of these methods brought our total sample size up to 119 individuals, with a majority representing the plain subspecies at 64, and within the Appalachian and Florida subspecies at 27 and 28 individuals. Just to give you an idea of the geographic distribution of all of our sampling, here we have, again, the subspecies boundaries and um, respective localities for each individual sampled. Obviously, a majority of these individuals came from the state of Texas, but within the plain subspecies, we also have the state of Arkansas, Kansas, Iowa, Nebraska, and South Dakota represented. And here, the smallest circles represent uh, just a sample size of one individual, with larger circles representing um, successively larger sample sizes. For the Appalachian subspecies in orange, we um, had six states also represented, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Kentucky. And for the Florida spotted skunk, obviously all of our samples came from the state of Florida.
Florida. However, a majority did come from one population in the central part of the state, 27 of 28 of them, and only um, one came from an adjacent county. So in the lab, tissues were extracted and amplified across 11 cross-species microsatellite markers. Um, meaning that we used primers that were originally developed for use in species other than the eastern spotted skunk. A majority of them were developed for use in the striped skunk, but also a few for the Eurasian badger and the North American river otter. The PCR products were analyzed on a capillary electrophoresis um, machine, and we obtained genotypes, genotypes to um, score from that. For our Site B analysis, we um, used carnivore-specific primers to amplify the whole entire gene, sent those amplicons off for sequencing um, at Texas A&M, and we aligned the sequences uh, using Mega-7 after we created a consensus sequence in Sequencer. So this is our, our first result of structure within the um, eastern spotted skunk, and same maximum likelihood tree based on our cytochrome B gene sequences. And basically, you see the presence of two highly supported nodes on these trees, um, which are bootstrap support values. The blue clade is monophyletic and contains all individuals belonging to the plains subspecies. With the uh, second the second node at 89% bootstrap support um, is highly supported. However, it does contain individuals belonging to both the Appalachian and Florida subspecies. However, it was not, this analysis was not able to distinguish um, the two subspecies from each other. But for the most part, the Florida individuals in gray formed a subcluster within this orange um, part of the tree with the exception of two individuals here that actually clustered with an individual from South Carolina. However, again, the only significant support values that we received for this analysis were those two I pointed out to you earlier. So we can't really draw any conclusions um, on any substructuring present higher on in this tree. For our microsatellite data set, Tests of genetic structure indicated that the optimum number of clusters present containing all three subspecies was just two, with all of the plains individuals falling into one group and all of the Appalachian and Florida individuals falling into a second group. If you're unfamiliar with structure plots and how they work, basically each bar represents one individual and that individual's approximate membership to a particular cluster is proportional to the amount that that color occupies. So I think you can see my mouse, but um, for example, this is one individual and it has about a 99% genetic identity to the blue clade and only a 1% genetic identity to the orange clade. However, the program structure is only capable of detecting the uppermost hierarchical level of structure present in a data set. So we performed a second analysis that excluded the plain subspecies to determine if a lower level of structure was present between the Appalachian and Florida subspecies. For this second analysis, again, we found that the optimum number of clusters containing the two subspecies is just two this time, with all Appalachian and Florida individuals falling into their separate respective clusters. What I want to point out from this structure analysis and from the previous one is the high average membership each individual has to its particular cluster. Um, providing early support for the validity of the subspecies designations and also providing evidence um, of a lack of genetic exchange occurring among them as well. With respect to our genetic variability of the eastern spotted skunk, across all three subspecies, we found that the average um, heterozygosity 
and allelic richness did not differ. However, there was a substantially higher number of private alleles found within the plain subspecies. And private alleles are those that are found in only one population or in this case subspecies and are not shared or present in any other group that you're um, comparing to. So this high number 28 of private alleles in the plain subspecies is perhaps indicating the harboring of alleles by the skunks um, due to a lack of gene flow occurring beyond their um, range. To determine the level of differentiation and percent divergence present among the three subspecies, we utilized two metrics. Um, for differentiation, we calculated FST values, which uh, basically range on a scale from zero to one, with values at zero or very close to zero, indicating um, gene flow is readily occurring in populations or subspecies that you're looking at are in panmixia. Um, values progressively higher towards one, not necessarily at one. Usually a value of 0 0.2 or higher is considered fairly differentiated, um, indicating a lack of gene flow occurring among groups. So for our skunks, we found the highest degree of differentiation present between the plain subspecies and the Appalachian subspecies, um, and the lowest between the Appalachian and Florida subspecies. However, these values 1 point, or sorry, 0 0.178 all the way up to 0 0.322 are all considered fairly um, significantly differentiation um, is present. With respect to the percent divergence present among the three subspecies, these were all calculated from our site B data set. We found a very similar pattern whereby the plain subspecies was most highly divergent from the Appalachian Florida group in that tree that I showed you. Um, however, the Appalachian and Florida individuals were only 1.2% divergent from each other. So to revisit our first objective, which was to determine the validity of the subspecies designations, um, we did find very high levels of differentiation among the subspecies, ranging from 0 0.178 to 0 0.322, and the significance of these values perhaps become more profound when we compare them to some values found in other um, North American carnivores. Somewhat common carnivores such as the striped skunk and the badger exhibit almost no degree of differentiation or structure present with their very low levels of 0.02 and 0.03. Um, and really it's the differentiation observed in the island spotted skunk with this value of 0.208 that's more on par with the levels of differentiation we found in the eastern spotted skunk. And this is all pretty interesting because the island spotted skunk is a subspecies of the western spotted skunk and only occurs in the Channel Island archipelago off the coast of California. And that 0.28 value was a comparison from those island spotted skunks to mainland western spotted skunks in California and Oregon and Washington, where there's obviously a huge geographic barrier um, separating them. Yet we found very similar, if not higher levels of differentiation present among the eastern spotted skunk subspecies. Additionally, our structure analyses, like I already uh, mentioned, um, had very high membership coefficients, meaning that individuals were assigned to a respective um, population or cluster with a um, very high degree of accuracy, 98.5%. However, our site B analysis wasn't really able to differentiate very well the Appalachian from the Florida subspecies, um, but it did distinguish the plain subspecies as being very unique. And we think the inability for the separation between the Appalachian and Florida subspecies could be because of their more recent divergence from each other. So um, events associated with quaternary climate change anywhere from 177,000 to 88,000 years ago served to inundate the state of Florida with a ton of water um, that 
perhaps isolated Florida populations from those more north in distribution, um, present day Appalachian subspecies. And it's only when the sea levels receded in the Holocene that these two subspecies now perhaps were able to achieve secondary contact with each other. To determine the genetic variability of the eastern spotted skunk, um, it's really easy when we compare it to levels found in other endangered, well-known endangered carnivores, especially ones that occupy similar habitats, um, shrubland, grassland areas, um, just like the eastern spotted skunk, such as the black-footed ferret in the San Joaquin kit box. So on average, we had um, slightly higher levels of heterozygosity and comparison to any of the other carnivores, uh, but our allelic richness um, did seem to be much higher. So both of these are metrics of genetic variability of a species, and allelic richness um, is very important because it, it having a higher number of alleles per locus um, could help ensure the adaptive potential of the population in the future. So, in conclusion, we found strong support for subspecies validity, especially with respect to the plains spotted skunk. There were high levels of differentiation, high membership, and a high number of private alleles in all three subspecies, which do provide support for the treatment of each of these as distinct evolutionarily significant units. Again, especially with respect to the plain spotted skunk. Um, and this is all important because although we were using neutral markers to um, complete our analysis, there could be other underlying genetic components contributing to differences that we see in behavior or physiology or habitat selection or anything else at um, population scales or subspecies scales. So just knowing that these three subspecies are fairly distinct units um, could help with the successful implementation of management strategies in the future. And with that, we have a ton of people to thank for our project, um, most notably the Comptroller's Office for providing funding, and um, everyone on our technical advisory panel, all the um, individuals and organizations who provided loan tissue and donated tissue, everyone who let us uh, conduct surveys on their land and who helped us conduct surveys. So thank you everybody for listening. Thank you for your presentation. Next up, we're going to have Bonnie. Bonnie is pursuing a doctoral degree in biomedical sciences with the certification in applied biodiversity science in the Department of Veterinary Pathobiology in the College of Veterinary Medicine and Biomedical Sciences at AM University. She holds a BS in geology and geophysics from Yale University and MS equivalent in organism, organismal biology and autonomy from the University of Chicago. Having worked for a full-time wildlife rehabilitator for 15 years, specializing in skunk care and rehabilitation for 11 years, Bonnie is the founder and executive director of Dove Key Ranch Wildlife Rehabilitation Incorporation. She serves on the board of directors for the International Wildlife Rehabilitation Council and is an active member of the Eastern Spotted Skunk Cooperative Study Group. Her research concentrates on wildlife disease ecology and focuses on conservation medicine within a One Health framework. Okay, hello everybody, good afternoon. I'm going to be talking about infectious pathogens in Eastern spotted skunks today. Um, I'm going to do a quick review of the previous work that's been done. Um, having said that, it's very limited in terms of the geographic regions that have been looked at in um, disease and spotted skunks. Uh, most of the spotted skunks were of the subspecies located in Florida and the Appalachian regions. And um, in most of these studies, they were only interested in specific pathogens and parasites, and the incidence of these in spotted skunks was more incidental than an actual concentration of the study. And for that reason, there's not a really good description for any of these studies as far as the clinical symptoms and importance of these diseases in populations of eastern spotted skunks. Um, now I'm going to move 
on after the review into what we've gotten as preliminary results from some live trapping efforts that I've been doing with um, working with Dr. Dowler's group and Clinton and Alex already reviewed kind of the live trapping protocols that they've been doing. So I'm going to look at some, I'm going to discuss some of what we've gotten result wise from the disease end of that. And then I'm going to outline some of the future research I'm going to be conducting as part of my PhD thesis at Texas A&M. So jumping right into it, um, there have been two bacterial pathogens that were described for eastern spotted skunks. These are for the Appalachian and Florida subspecies. Uh, tularemia, which you can look at the transmission cycle to the right of the screen, um, usually is asymptomatic in striped skunks. Um, not clear what it does to eastern spotted skunks, though it can uh, in other mammal species, it tends to have mnemonic forms um, that can be lethal without treatment and immunocompromised in young individuals. Uh, the most frequent transmission of this is by contact with infected animals or vectors like ticks, mosquitoes, deer flies, and the reservoir hosts are uh, usually rabbits, rodents, and galliform birds, so aka dinner for eastern spotted skunks. That's probably the main route of infection in these guys. Um, leptospirosis is on the left of your screen, the transmission cycle. In this case, this study was done in Georgia, and they did note that there were no symptoms or clinical pathology related to positive cases of leptospirosis in eastern spotted skunks, although they only had about a 1% population um, positive for that in the eastern spotted skunks they sampled. They had uh, 25 individuals. The signs and symptoms of this disease in immunocompromised and young can range anywhere from things like headaches and fevers to severe bleeding from the lungs or meningitis um, resulting in death. It's usually transmitted by animal urine um, and contaminated water or soil containing animal urine. And it can live actually in the reproductive tract of wild mammals and be transmitted during mating as well. The primary hosts are rats, mice, and moles. Once again, these are main food sources for eastern spotted skunks, and a range of other mammals that include um, rabbits and other food sources for skunks are also positive for the disease as secondary hosts. Uh, it's interesting to note that leptospirosis uh, incidence correlates directly with the amount of rainfall in areas. So it's seasonal and temperate climates, whereas in more tropical climates, like in South Texas, it would be a year-round occurrence. As far as fungal infections, uh, they have been noted as having histoplasmosis. Again, this was a study in Georgia. Um, it's usually a subclinical infection in healthy individuals, but it can cause pneumonia in immunocompromised and young individuals. It's associated most strongly with droppings of birds and bats, um, and it's highly endemic in areas around chicken houses and places where there have been large flocking bird concentrations, such as starlings, which are invasive species, and blackbirds. Viruses, rabies. I'm not going to talk a lot about transmission cycles of rabies, um, because I think we're all pretty familiar with how rabies affect skunks. If not, you can ask me questions about it later. Um, I wanted to focus on some of the statistics that came out of the paper by Ortley et al. in 2009, where they reviewed um, skunks and rabies in Texas. That, uh, this was based on skunks that were submitted for rabies testing to the Texas Department of State Health Services from 1985 through 2007. Uh, during that time period, there were 4,846 rabid skunks. Of uh, those, 4,821 were striped skunks, and only there were only, sorry, six, which is 0.12 percent, were identified as spotted skunks. They were not identified um, either as western or eastern spotted skunks, but that's kind of the data we're working with. What I do want to bring your attention to are the two graphs at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the one is noting the prevalence of rabies in skunks across the year, and as you can see, it peaks in the March-April region. Why this is important is because that's representing a peak in the striped skunks mostly. Um, that is also representative of their breeding cycles, which is that they, the males come out of hibernation, um, sorry, not hibernation, dormancy, around January and February and start looking for females to mate with. At that time, they're 
at the time of the breeding season, their ranges are greatly expanded. They're coming into greater contact and being more social. And so that's where you get your peak of transmission of rabies. One or two months later, they're actually showing clinical symptoms of that. And that's where you're getting that peak in March and April. Why that's important for Eastern spotted skunks is because that March and April is the peak of their breeding season. So they're getting hit head on with the striped skunk um, high prevalence of rabies, right, as they're being more active in their breeding season. The second figure is showing the location of um, rabies positive skunks, urban versus rural. What's important to note here is that the highest incidence of rabies is in rural areas, and because those are the areas that are predominantly used by the eastern spotted skunks in Texas, as was noted in Clint's presentation, um, that means that, again, they're strongly being affected by rabies probably in the state of Texas. So moving on, um, as was noted before in Dr. Dowler's talk, Gomper and Hackett had addressed some of the issues with um, disease potentially um, being contributors to population declines in spotted skunks. Distemper was mentioned and Gomper and Hackett 2005 pretty much dismissed it as anything important in terms of the initial population decline in eastern spotted skunks because it tends to show periodicity and its um, population declines and there was no evidence of that based on the fur trapping surveys. Um, it was a pretty steady decline and there were no ups and downs as what you would expect from a rabies or distemper outbreak. However, parvovirus is pretty much um, unknown very well how it affects skunks overall. However, it, in striped skunks, there have been outbreaks of the Aleutian mink disease parvovirus, the mink enteritis virus, and canine parvovirus. And they can also be um, uh, inoculated with feline parvovirus um, in the lab and they show clinical symptoms of that. In all of these cases, there are heavy um, morbidity and mortality events associated with that. So this could be affecting um, eastern spotted skunks across the range, as well as in Texas, just from um, a personal communication from my experience doing wildlife rehabilitation in skunks. I have gotten in canine parvovirus um, kits, as well as distemper kits in adults. So parasites, I know these are, this is a crazy list, so I'm not gonna go through them individually. However, various species of fleas, lice, mites, and ticks have been recovered from Eastern spotted skunks. That's pretty much across the range. Um, the most important thing to take out of this list is that many of these species are vectors for infectious disease, such as Lyme disease, Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the case of ticks, uh, tularemia in the case of um, ticks as well. Um, urine typhus in the case of fleas, and a whole host of other nasty infectious diseases that could be secondary um, effectors on this population. As far as the en endoparasites go, the protozoans are mostly coccidia, which uh, affect, again, immunocompromised and juvenile individuals pretty harshly, and um, they cause mostly gastrointestinal distress, so vomiting, diarrhea, weight loss, and animals usually perish from those effects. Uh, the other gastrointestinal parasites that they're affected with are helminths, and these can cause anything from just slight, you know, slight anemia, slight uh, fitness reduction in these guys to, to death if they have multiple infections or if they're immunocompromised and young. They also have respiratory system parasites. These guys, the prenosoma and capillaria, are also known as lungworms, and they can cause death again in juveniles and, um, and immunocompromised individuals, whereas in healthy adults, they don't tend to have as much of an effect. Parasites uh, of the nasal sinuses are important for these guys on a health level probably because they do actually infect healthy adults as well as juveniles and immunocompromised. What they do is they actually burrow into that sinus area and they can cause damage to, uh, as you can see, the frontal bones there, but also they can enter into the brain case. Um, and these may actually cause death in healthy individuals in certain cases. There's not a lot known about how they interact with adults as well as juveniles in this population. 
but they have been found in Texas in these guys. And then in endoparasites, um, we also have the Trichinella spirellus, which is usually an intestinal parasite, but it can also insist in striated muscles. The reason why I'm pulling this out individually for us as a Texas parasite, it may be important because we have such a problem with the feral hog population and they are main host of this parasite. Um, and so they may be exacerbating the problem of Trichinella in the native wildlife species, as well as us in humans in Texas. So the summary of the previous work, what I want you to take away from it is essentially that aside from rabies, most of these uh, infectious diseases that have been confirmed and um, listed for Eastern spotted skunks are more of a threat to immunocompromised and young individuals than they are for healthy individuals. Um, However, even if they're not lethal in the healthy guys, they do cause reduced fitness and that may influence their reproductive success overall. And then you have the um, problem of having kind of the quote death by a thousand cuts where you have either a combination of these diseases or these diseases mixed with other factors such as malnutrition, um, exposure to toxic pesticides and that kind of thing, which would cause um, overall um, morbidity and mortality. Uh, the other factors uh, that these would have influence on are those three R's that Shauna presented as far as looking at viability, the redundancy, resiliency, and representation in, in the population overall. These all diseases all affect those aspects. The other thing I want you to notice is that there are huge knowledge gaps. There are many other diseases, I guarantee you, that they have out there that just have not been picked up in otherwise um, other surveys. Uh, nobody knows the prevalence of these diseases across populations. Um, nobody really understands the host vector pathogen interactions, especially in eastern spotted skunks and what exactly the impact is on individuals from like a clinical symptom aspect to populations and then overall what effect they're having on the species on the whole. So in order to start addressing this, uh, we started to do a little bit of a disease survey um, with the plain spotted skunk sampling that was being done by the Angelo State University crew. Um, I kind of jumped on at the Katy Prairie Conservancy and thereafter. And during that trapping season session, we were able to capture three adults. And kind of the plan was to get everything we could from them sample wise and sample those for everything we could think of to do um, from a health perspective. Um, from all three adults, we did get blood samples, which um, we tested for Chagas disease, and I'll talk more about that later. Um, they were all negative for that um, based on looking for DNA in the blood samples. Uh, we took pharyngeal mucous membrane swabs, which we tested for canine distemper, and they were all negative. We took fecal samples and did a float and centrifuge on them by two separate veterinary clinics, and they were clean, negative, although that doesn't necessarily confirm that they didn't have anything because uh, oftentimes these fecals will miss, you know, the heavier eggs that don't flow up to the top. And then anything that's not currently shedding eggs uh, would not be kept. Than that. Two out of the three adults, we were atherosis and they were negative. However, um, we were able to, out of three, to notice that they had clinical signs of fungal dermatophytosis, that's AKA, that's ringworm. Um, and so we cultured the areas that were the most dry red skinned, and um, there were slight areas of alopecia on the tail as well of the first one, and we were able to culture one of those swabs and positively identify it as microsporum canis, which is up in the upper, upper top there. And ectoparasite collection was very successful. We collected several lice and fleas from all of the um, skunks, and we will be identifying those, and the fleas will most likely be tested for murine typhus as well. Uh, we collected Ixidae scapularis nymphs, as you can see from the picture there, they're tiny little guys, which are pretty important in um, various tick-borne pathogen cycles, especially in Texas. We're worried about things like Lyme disease. And um, we will be testing those later for um, presence of various tick-borne pathogens. 
Uh, as far as the Fort Hood trapping, they were successfully able to get an adult and we were able to run a fecal on, on that adult and it was also clean and negative and that was based on two veterinary clinic diagnoses as well. They were able to collect an Ixidis scapularis, which was engorged, so we're very excited to run that for tick-borne pathogens. And the blood sample um, that they were able to collect did come back, in fact, positive for Chagas disease. And the reason why this is really important is because this is the first case, a uh, positive case of Chagas disease, not only for Eastern spotted skunks in Texas, but for Eastern spotted skunks overall, and for the genus of Spilagale overall. Um, the other thing that's um, really important about the Chagas case is because Chagas in, uh, is a zoonotic disease and it's an emerging infectious disease in, in the United States. It's uh, a protozoan parasite that lives in the blood and develops in tissue um, and does tissue damage when it is developing in the tissue. Uh, it usually, it usually accumulates in cardiac tissue, so it is known to cause both um, acute and long-term chronic uh, cardiac disease in mammals. It's transmitted primarily through the vector of triatoma bugs, bugs, which are um, also known as kissing bugs, and it's either transmitted um, orally, which is probably the main transmission for skunks since they eat triatoma bugs, um, but it can also be through um, the bite of the tree tillman insect while they're feeding. They also drop their feces behind them. And then at the uh, spot of feeding, it causes irritation. Animals will scratch in the feces that have the um, actual trypanosoma cruzi protozoans into the, and that introduces them into the bloodstream of the animal. So moving on, future research. Um, we're planning on doing continued surveillance uh, across the eastern spotted skunk range with a focus on the skunks in Texas for ectoparasites. Um, endoparasite surveillance is going to be done, as far as I understand, by uh, Hannah Jones at Angelo State University, who is one of Dr. Dowler's students. And we're also going to continue to look for ringworm in these guys and see um, how if we can identify it down to species level. Additionally, we're going to start running samples of um, blood samples for our hantavirus exposure. Uh, we had a positive striped skunk exposure um, that came out of 20 samples that we submitted. Uh, and that's going to be done at, in collaboration with Dr. Ivan Castro Arellano's lab in Texas State University. Um, and we're also going to be collaborating with Timothy Erickson at Baylor College of Medicine to look at murine typhus in these guys based on blood samples and any fleas that we can collect. As for me, my main project is going to be looking at arthropod-borne zoonotic emerging infectious diseases across the state of Texas um, mainly, but I'm also interested in those throughout the eastern spotted skunk range in eastern spotted skunks. I'm going to be screening um, blood and ticks for tick-borne pathogens, including Borrelia species. So Borrelia terricate is the relapsing fever, um, Borrelia burgdorferi is Lyme disease. We're also going to be looking at um, testing for Ehrlichia, Anaplasma, and Rickettsia. rickettsia. Uh, we're also going to be screening blood for Chagas disease, and that's in collaboration with the crew at the Baylor College of Medicine in Dr. Christy Murray's lab. Primarily, Rodian Gorchakov has been really great at helping with all of this. The reason why I picked um, tick-borne pathogens and Chagas disease as the main focus for this is because, as you can see from the maps included at the very base in the middle, is the um, looking at Trypanosoma cruzi, so Chagas disease across the United States. Um, the one to the right of that is the incidence of relapsing fever, and the one up above is ehrlichiosis. And as you can see from these maps, um, these diseases are very widespread in the range of eastern spotted skunks. The other reason I chose these is because they're either confirmed or um, suspected um, causes of clinical disease in striped skunks and other skunk species. And there's a potential growing threat in, in light of climate warming that these um, diseases, as well as their arthropod vectors and the hosts of these diseases are going to spread across this range. And the other aspect of these diseases which makes them really good for study is their um, zoonotic nature. 
which is going to give us an opportunity to study them in a one health framework and incorporate human, domestic animal, and ecosystem health into our studies as well. The other thing I'm going to be looking at is chronic stress, and we're going to measure chronic stress um, as evidenced in cortisol concentration in fur samples. As you can see from the bottom, cortisol is um, secreted into fur, and so by sampling the um, the non-cuticle fur, you can actually uh, you can actually look at the cortisol levels in that fur to measure chronic stress, which is any stress that occurred while that fur was being created. This is in collaboration with the endocrinology lab at the Toronto Zoo, and that's uh, Dr. Gabriella Mastromonaco. And in light of all of those, we're going to assess the habitat fragmentation that overlaps where our samples are coming from. That's going to allow us to evaluate the associations between disease status, stress, and habitat use. So some of the questions we're going to be looking to answer is, is chronic stress associated with uh, varying states of habitat fragmentation? Are skunks that are more urban, more stressed out in a chronic way, or do they not really care whether they're urban, suburban, or rural? We're also going to be looking at chronic stress effects on disease outcomes. Um, does having a higher level of chronic stress make you more susceptible to some of these diseases that we're measuring? And then also looking at habitat fragmentation's effect on disease outcomes. So actually, does habitat fragmentation itself cause or influence the prevalence of disease in the populations that live in that habitat fragmented area? Um, this is a big component of looking at disease transmission across the wildlife and domestic animal boundary in that if you have greater habitat fragmentation, there's more odds that the wildlife is going to come into contact with some of those animals that are in the domestic realm and you're going to have disease transmission across those boundaries. So in summary, thank you to everybody who's helped out with the project so far and will be continuing to help out. That's um, the members of Dr. Maria de Vega Sands Lime Lab, Dr. Melissa Nolan, and everybody else, Dr. Christine Murray's um, lab at Baylor College of Medicine, and especially to everybody at Angelo State University, Dr. Daller, Clint, and Alex for helping out with collecting samples so far and helping through the process in the future. Uh, Dr. Melinda Looper was great help in IDing the ringworm specimen that we were able to find, and Joseph Motorelli, who um, has devised the assay, assay that I'm going to be using to do the tick-borne pathogens. So, thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. That was great. And if you have any questions for her, please email or stick around, and she'll be here at the end. Um, we also have our next presenter is going to be Vicki Jackson from the University of Central Oklahoma. She's gonna talk about her upcoming research um, to look for the planes by the skunk. All right, well, thank you so much, Kimberly, for organizing this. The, the timing of this webinar is perfect for me as we are just getting started uh, looking for plain spotted skunks in Oklahoma. I'm working with Matt Fullerton and Jared Davis from the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation. And hopefully, once we find some spotted skunks, we'll be collaborating with Sue Fairbanks from Oklahoma State University as well. So the purpose of, of our two and a half year uh, research project is really to understand what is going on currently uh, with the geographic distribution of uh, plain spotted skunks here at Oklahoma. And like most other uh, areas in the spotted skunks, geographic distribution, what we know now is primarily based on historical fur data. So in the 30s to 50s, um, most of the pelts were coming from central and northeastern parts of Oklahoma, uh, with very small populations in the southeastern and the panhandle. Uh, in the panhandle, we not only have eastern spotted skunks, but we may also have western spotted skunks. So those panhandle uh, records may may not really be uh, appropriate. In the 30s, to there were about 20,000 pelts uh, bought by state fur dealers, and you see consistently declining numbers, where in the 1970s, the entire decade, there were only 1,500 pelts. Uh, so in 
the pelt data, it was mostly around this portion, the central portion of Oklahoma, uh, where uh, most of those pelts were found. This uh, map over here was created uh, by Tyler and Lodes to really look at the distribution of museum specimens. And you see it's fairly uh, all over the state of Oklahoma in almost all of our eco regions. Most of these museum records, though, uh, predated 1980. And we really don't have a great understanding of uh, from 1980 to 2017 what's happened to these distributions. Are, are they expanding? Are they still there? Are they declining? You notice on this map, this little green polygon right here. This is the Wachita Mountains in Arkansas, where Damon Lesmeister found a, a pretty good population of eastern spotted skunks. So what we're hoping to do is look in these areas that are close to this known population in Arkansas. This green area right here is the Wachita National Forest in Oklahoma. We have down here in McCurtain, the McCurtain uh, wilderness area that's kind of surrounded by uh, this green, which is the Wachita uh, wildlife management area. Uh, and then we have uh, Hanobia uh, right over in here. So we're hoping to start our surveys close to where we're hoping they were in Arkansas and still are in Arkansas, and then expand those surveys uh, west and then also south to pick up some hopeful populations in these other areas. This is the Oklahoma portion of the Wachita National Forest, and you see the kind of blue uh, coloration here is pine or pine oak forest, and that's the vast majority of the Watchall National Forest. Uh, it's interspersed uh, somewhat with this pink color, which is cultivated loblolly pine, and then this kind of orange color is uh, cultivated fields or uh, pasture land. We are very hopeful that we will find spotted skunks throughout this area. Uh, and if we do, we'll then uh, start moving uh, southward uh, into McCurtain County and westward uh, as well. Uh, in McCurtain County, this is the McCurtain Wildlife Area, and then surrounding it is the Wachita Wildlife Management Area. And again, it's predominantly uh, pine and pine oak forests interspersed with some cultivated pine and then also some uh, fields and pasture. So our, our plan of action, like I said, we haven't started yet. Uh, I have hired an undergraduate researcher, and we will start in January uh, with our initial camera surveys, following the techniques of uh, most of the people who spoke today, uh, setting up some uh, reconics cameras uh, throughout the Wachita National Forest in areas that we hope to, to find spotted skunks, baited with sardines or, or mackerels. Uh, this initial camera survey is, is really to uh, gain a better understanding of what's out there and the methodologies uh, that we'll need to really uh, successfully find spotted skunks uh, in Oklahoma, what we can use from other projects that will work here. Uh, then hopefully, uh, while we're doing this initial survey, uh, I'll find a master's student who can begin in August. Um, in August, when this new master's student comes on, uh, they will complete a thesis proposal and through this thesis proposal identify some specific uh, questions that we want to address about Oklahoma eastern spotted skunks. Uh, we have funding through a state wildlife grant to pay for a graduate and undergraduate research team to survey for two survey seasons. And we're going to run those surveys from October to March 2018, 2019, and then again October, March 2019, 2020. So uh, by the end of the summer of 2020, we hopefully will have a, a fairly good handle about 
that spotted skunk uh, distribution in at least southeastern Oklahoma. With that uh, data that we'll collect, we'll be using occupancy models in order to predict uh, detection, uh, which survey methods would uh, be more successful uh, for us in Oklahoma for detecting uh, spotted skunks, and then also uh, look at occupancy, uh, what habitats they might be selecting for or selecting against. Uh, and then this information can then uh, be used by Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation as well as uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service for uh, any of their further uh, conservation efforts. So my project hasn't gotten started yet, so, so this presentation was really quick and brief. Uh, I just wanted to uh, thank you guys for the opportunity to learn from what's already uh, been happening and extend a request if you have any students who might be interested in working with me to have them contact me at thejackson4 at uco.edu or if you have any advice for me I would really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, next up we are going to have Bobby present from the University of Wyoming. He's I'm going to talk about the study design and preliminary results from the Spotted Skunk Survey in Wyoming. I believe he's in a warmer location though right now, so good for him. That's nice. All right, great. Um, yeah, so yeah, I just got to Florida yesterday, so sitting out by my parents' pool giving you this presentation. It's a lot nicer than it was back in Wyoming. Um, we started the study on spotted, spotted skunks in the spring of last year, and we're still going strong. Um, and also, I wanted to say that uh, I've enjoyed all of the presentations so far. Uh, so a quick overview of spotted skunks. I'm sure that you guys pretty much all know all of this. They're omnivores. They're uh, pretty strictly nocturnal. They don't hibernate, although they'll spend uh, prolonged periods of time in dens. Uh, Throughout the winter, uh, they use multiple den sites, and one of the coolest things about them is that they do handstands. And you can see my cursor. This is uh, one of the images we captured on our camera traps in Wyoming. Uh, so there's two species of spotted skunks in Wyoming. There's the western and the eastern species. Uh, this species boundary is from Dr. Buzkert's book, um, published in 2016. Um, and it's a proposed species boundary, but then we, we're not actually sure where they occur. And over here in the right-hand corner, you can see um, the two species ranges. So what's the difference? Um, the big difference between the eastern and western species is that they vary in their different reproductive strategies. Uh, so the eastern species does this interesting thing um, called delayed implantation, uh, where they breed in the fall, um, but then uh, the, the gestation and Actually, I'm sorry, this is the Western stock species I'm talking about. So the Western species, it breeds in the fall, there's delayed implantation of the blastocyst and they don't gestate and give birth until the spring. Whereas the Eastern species breeds in the spring, gestates and then gives birth. Um, they're very indistinguishable, um, but they do have a difference in that the males have a, a different sized vacua um, in the Easterns. Uh, the, especially the plains subspecies uh, rather than the eastern or the western species, which is Gracilis gracilis in Wyoming. So in 2012, they were, the eastern plains subspecies was petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act 2011, I'm sorry. And then in 2012, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, as we learned before, found substantial evidence that the listing may be warranted due to range-wide declines in abundance. So our project goals are to use genomics to differentiate between the eastern and western spotted skunks in Wyoming. Uh, we want to determine whether or not like uh, hybridization, hybridization, hybridization is occurring between eastern and western spotted skunks. And we want to, with this genomic data, assess the distinctness of the plain subspecies of eastern spotted skunk. Um, we also want to determine the distribution and habitat selection for the two species here in Wyoming. Um, so in our study design, uh, we have the uh, we wanted to know whether 
Um, white spotted skunks in Wyoming have the same habitat preference as uh, shown in previous research. Uh, we wanted to know where we should survey for spotted skunks, and then for fun, I wanted to uh, look for potential hotspots for spotted skunks in Wyoming. So here I have a map. Um, the blue dots are all of our uh, public records uh, and historical records that were collected uh, through the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. Um, the red triangles are from a preliminary camera survey uh, done by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. And then also two summers ago, I conducted a pilot camera trap survey and my detections are uh, the yellow triangles. Um, so we looked at uh, forest canopy in relation to all of these records, 88 in total. And we also wanted to know um, whether um, there was an association with riparian and rocky outcropping. Uh, the Wyoming Game and Fish and their camera survey, they set, found a strong association for um, spotted skunks and rocky outcroppings. So we used the minimum known home range, um, 500 meters, to create a buffer around these habitats. And we found that 92% of our records occurred in areas with 5% forest canopy or less. Um, they also, we also found that they select for rock outcrops near water disproportionate to availability with a chi-squared test of statistic um, p-value less than 0 0.001. And that value is actually 0 0.00018. Um, so I took these records that we had, and I wanted to know where we might have potential hotspots for spotted skunk. And the caveat being is that when you create a kernel density estimate, you need a survey that's representative of the entire population. And since these are historic records, there may be bias involved. And um, so, you know, uh, this is taken with a grain of salt, but there is an interesting uh, pattern here where we have hot spots running up um, through the rocky area uh, east of Laramie, where the university is located. Uh, this is Vitavu, it goes up through the Laramie Mountains and then into uh, the Seminoles and through Jeffrey City and up into Bighorn Basin. Uh, if you know Wyoming, this entire region is full of rocky outcroppings. So this area might provide a large contiguous habitat uh, where that would support a large population of spotted skunks. So we merged our rocky outcropping and water layers and we put a 50 meter of buffer around those habitats and then we intersected that with public land and came up with our uh, suitable habitat that we could survey. We generated points. If you remember, this is the proposed boundary by bus skirt between the eastern and western spotted skunk. We generated far more points on the eastern side of the state to uh, put more effort toward the eastern plains subspecies and um, less on the western part of the states where the western spotted skunk is likely to occur. So you can notice here that our survey points um, are located uh, very close in general to historic records. So that's good news for us. It's a good study design validation. And here's just a graph of um, the nearest point of those historic records to a survey point. So here you can see the majority of them are within 10 kilometers. So then we grouped those survey points. Uh, first, we went through and we made sure that we could access them and that they were truly on habitat um, via Google Earth and uh, a Wyoming atlas. And then we grouped uh, the final points uh, by uh, 15 points. So we have two groups that go out at a time. Um, we survey 15 points at a time for two weeks. And at each of those points, we put three camera traps. And you can kind of see a rough schedule of uh, where we surveyed this summer. So at each uh, 
to the survey points, like I said, we put three camera traps. We spaced them at 250 to 500 meters apart. Uh, we placed bent bait and scent lure at each of those stations. Uh, we bait with dead pheasant chicks or dead mice. Uh, the pheasant chicks were um, mortalities from the hatching of a, a game farm in Wyoming and the mice are from a previous study. Uh, we also put a cotton, cotton rope uh, tied to a branch up above the lure or the bait and that's hooked with a commercial scent lure. Um, personally, I prefer the Hawbreaker 600 if you're interested. Um, and we, those chicks or mice, they're tied to either a branch or a tent stake um, on the ground. And this uh, gives us a, a lot of pictures because they'll sit there and they'll pull at it and they're trying to get at it. So we'll get a variety of angles on the skunk. And a lot of the times we'll get you know, more than 80 pictures of individuals. Um, anyways, wherever we find them on our cameras, uh, we place out uh, tomahawk live traps and we try and catch them. So, um, so when we catch them, here's what we do. Uh, we remove the skunk from the trap location with a burlap sack uh, to attempt not to get sprayed and cover it to keep them calm. Uh, we place the trap in a clear container and, uh, with a rag so st uh, soaked in isofluorine. Um, that's rapid induction, rapid recovery. Uh, we monitor, monitor, monitor them for signs of the drug effect. Uh, we wait till they have delayed reaction times. They start to get a little woozy, put their head down. Uh, once they're um, sufficiently sedated, but from the isofluorine, we administer 0.03 to 0.09 milliliters of uh, telazole, and um, that's highly diluted given the size of the animal. And uh, the dose we give them depends on the animal's weight. We have a dosage chart um, by weight, and it also um, depends on what we're doing with them. So if we need them out for a little longer, we might give them a bigger dose than if um, you know we just have to reprogram one of their GPS colors, like I'll talk about in a minute. So from each skunk, we collect an ear punch uh, for DNA. We also pull some hair out of it uh, for backup DNA. Uh, we take individual measurements like neck girth, heart girth, hind foot, upper canine skull width and length. Uh, then we insert a pit tag uh, for ID, and then we uh, take photos of the individual uh, for IDs as well. And we'll take pictures of their back and their side and the dot they have on the nose. And uh, also they have very unique markings on their chin, uh, which is obviously only uh, useful for live captured individuals. And then uh, the animal's health and safety is of our utmost concern, so we take uh, respiratory rates and temperatures um, throughout the, the capture period. <clears throat> Release them. Um, we zip tie the locking me mechanism to the door of the trap so that the door swings freely and the animal can push itself out. And then we put a little um, stick through the front of the trap underneath the door to kind of hold the door open, but also to make it so there's a little bit of an obstacle coming out of the trap. That way um, they can only leave once they're um, not under the effects of the drug. And then to coax them out, we will put in a safe location um, some dead pheasant chicks um, as kind of a reward for taking place in our study. So our results to date, um, we've had spotted skunks detected at 20 of our more than 250 uh, survey locations. Um, and then we've also captured 28 individuals. And of those 28 individuals, we have fit 10 adults with uh, really cool collars by Low Tech. Um, they only weigh 20 grams. And uh, yeah, so. So that's been an interesting new component of the study. Uh, those collars, they emit a um, VHF signal, which we can use to track them and remotely download the data. Um, this is just an example of the collar data from one of our adult females. Um, this is about two weeks of data. Um, 
you can see the scale bar down there is at 859 meters. So the home range is obviously larger than that. And uh, you can definitely see the strong association uh, with this rocky outcropping uh, near Jeffrey City, Wyoming. Uh, so part two of the presentation, I'll talk about the genomic portion real quick. Um, this delayed implantation of the blastocyst occurs in um, some mustelids and also uh, some marsupials, and um, it's been coaxed in mice using knockout genes. And uh, on the slide here, you see a number of genes that have um, been identified as potentially having a role in delayed implantation. Uh, this is a cool little uh, image figure here um, that shows how upregulation and down regulation of these uh, gene encoded proteins um, might uh, uh, have a role in the activation of the blastocyst. Um, so we're going to uh, use aluminum the next generation sequencing for our sequencing um, and we're looking for these genes of interest as well as SNPs and RADs um, to try and quickly identify the species that we have um, in Wyoming. So because we have two um, species here in Wyoming, we have tissue samples and blood samples from the 28 individuals captured, but we also have an additional 38 tissue samples um, from museum specimens, collaborative projects, and uh, trappers. And you can see there the, the list of states that we have um, tissue samples from, including Washington, Oregon, California, Colorado, Wyoming, Arizona, Texas, Kansas, and Nebraska. Um, places like Washington should be true western spotted skunks and Kansas and Nebraska should be eastern plain subspecies so um, we can um, use these uh, samples to create a kind of a, a reference library uh, for the skunks that we have in Wyoming um, so far with our sequencing or our sorry our DNA extractions um, we're getting pretty high yields um, so we're happy with that um, in the future, we want to refine our study design using this year's data. Um, ideas that we have are including a moving window for rock outcrop area. So we found in Wyoming uh, a strong association with very large, extensive uh, granite boulder formations. Um, we also want to include higher order streams only in our study design. Um, so we spent some time this past summer surveying some flash flood washes and everything. And, you know, we want to maximize our detection and uh, omit the places that were, where we're very unlikely to get spotted skunks. I should say uh, as a caveat on that, um, the eastern part of the state does not have a lot of rocky outcroppings. Um, so we might have to adapt uh, our study design for the eastern spotted uh, skunk for, uh, you know, areas with juniper and riparian areas and the uh, few few rocky outcroppings that uh, occur over there. Um, we also want to adjust our survey schedule to coincide with uh, the breeding periods. So, you know, during the spring, we want to survey pretty much exclusively for the eastern spotted skunk in the eastern part of the state. And in the uh, fall, we want to survey more exclusively on the western part of the state. Um, this would be when the skunks are more active and we're more likely of detecting and trapping them. Um, so like I said, our preliminary analyses from the data we have so far does show a strong association um, with rocky outcroppings. Uh, and tracking these skunks on on these big rock formations uh, can be they can be hard to access and it can also be dangerous in the winter time when uh, there's a bunch of ice and snow in the crevices and whatnot and uh, uh, we're, we're talking about potentially using a customized drone drone with uh, telemetry equipment uh, to help us in our survey efforts 
And with that, uh, I would like to uh, give special thanks to my lab mates, our techs that have helped us out, my graduate committee, uh, people associated with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and our um, funding sources. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, next up, we're going to have David Scott Joukowsky talking about the updates for the Eastern Spotted Skunk Cooperative Study Group. In uh, 2015, we started the Eastern Spotted Skunk Study Group. Um, it was largely based on um, the this the finding that there were a lot of people doing spotted skunk research, but we weren't really talking about together and we were all looking at fairly similar things. And so there's ongoing work in Tennessee with Brian Carver's group in Alabama, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, West Virginia, Florida, Maryland. And a lot of these were at different universities and different agencies. And so this group was started to try to get everyone kind of talking together and seeing if we could collaborate and share ideas. And so we had our first meeting after being formed in 2015 and 2016 in Alabama. Uh, and then we had a working group meeting then, and then in 2017, we're at our second meeting, and that had not only a, a working group meeting, but a symposium on Eastern Spotted Skunks. Um, and it's been a very valuable way of us uh, kind of enhancing communication and identifying research priorities and, and common goals. We identified a, a next meeting in um, March of 2018. It uh, coincides with the uh, joint meeting of the different uh, bat diversity networks in the Eastern United States and Midwest, as well as the Southeast Mammal Colloquium. Uh, one of the, a few of the things that we've tried to do as a group, uh, initially last year, we talked about trying to write a multi-state grant to fund some broader scale collaborative work on the Eastern Spotted Skunk. And at the meeting, it came out that we really didn't know enough about the species to be developing um, some of the restoration criteria that multi-state grants wanted uh, to know what to, to prescribe. And so from that meeting, what we decided to do was try to draft a conservation plan. And so I've gotten feedback and I've used the listserv and the group of collaborators extensively to try to get this done. And I've just about completed it and we'll try to be sending it on the listserv fairly soon. But it really benefited because I was doing the tallies the other day for the study group and we have about 68 members right now and that's representing 16 different universities five federal agencies and 15 state agencies uh, and so this document uh, i'll be sharing uh, with the group hopefully in the next couple of weeks i'm just waiting to hear back on a couple of the last comments and sections but that should hopefully shed a lot of light on where your knowledge gaps are and potentially lead to more collaborative work um, and part of that is also we have a, a nice list of the state by state status. And so my some of my students and we've had this vetted by a lot of the state biologists over the past year in terms of trying to compile all of the information on like when the last sighting was within a state, what the conservation status is and policy and what ongoing research is going in every state uh, for the range of the species. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about if there's specific questions, but I just want to give an overview of what we've been up to so far. Well, that's very exciting and um, I look forward to seeing that come out. Um, if you don't have any more updates you'd like to give, we can open it up for the round table if anybody would be interested in doing that. Um, so we have the presenters here, or most of them, and then any questions from the audience, we'd be more than happy to have at this point. I actually have a quick question. Sure. So for all of the people who have actually gone out in the field and looked for spotted skunks, uh, what was maybe something that you would uh, advise me to prepare for? Any thoughts or suggestions? Um, one thing I would say is uh, prepare yourself for a lot of disappointment because most of the places that you survey for, you probably won't find them. Um, but when you do, it's uh, that much more exciting. And if you want, you can email me that question and I'll send it out to some of the researchers to see um, if they have more specific examples for you too, if you'd like. Go ahead. I would only add one little thing to that and, and talking to so some of my students have quite different problems in terms of monitoring. Some of them have a lot of luck finding spotted skunks and some have very little luck. And, and one thing that I've done is 
uh, had some of my students talk to some of the kind of the local experts on spotted skunks, at least here in the in the east. And so I've sent students to go and stay with a trapper in West Virginia or do some kind of non-traditional things to get students thinking like some of these local experts. And so kind of reaching out to some of the local trappers has been helpful, particularly where the spotted skunks are fairly rare or cryptic, um, was helpful for some of my students. I know that we have one more question from Colleen, but I cannot see what it is. If you can type in that question, um, I'd be more than happy to answer it or have whoever answer it. I have a question for the researchers involved with the uh, genetics. And, you know, a lot of the genetic analysis was done with samples over an unclear timeline, including samples that appeared from museum specimens. I guess I was curious if they thought that there could be genetic variability, differentiation between, I won't say years, but let's say decades. And I ask that because we know that, again, as these spotted skunk populations become more isolated, maybe there's more distinctiveness created between the subpopulations or even within a subpopulation. So I just wondered if there was concerns that getting a museum sample from decades ago, is that really comparable to a sample from a year ago? Because of course there's going to be some variability just because of the difference in the timeline. I also wanted to let Vicki still on the phone, just give her a heads up. Uh, maybe she's already looked into this, but North Carolina, we used to use Reconics in our spotted skunk camera surveys, and we found uh, that they were terrible at detecting small to medium-sized mammals, including spotted skunks. So we have switched to using Bushnell cameras, and I think most of the other researchers um, in the southeastern states are using Bushnell, so just if she's using Reconics, an awareness that that could impact her detection. If there aren't any more questions, um, I'm going to close the webinar for now. If you do come up with any questions, feel free to contact any of the presenters or email me here at this link, um, the EGESF webinar at cpa.texas.gov, and I'll be able to send that to the presenters as well. Thank you, everyone, for your time today.